two top ten teams, and the winner of today's game stays very much in the conversation for the college football player. Big 12, big game underway. Another third down at all. And throws an interception. The three touchdown deficit that Baylor's got to make up. At the seven, he gets the call. He walks in, touchdown. At second and nine, long ball, streak on the sideline, touchdown. And the highest scoring game in this series history. We're not done yet. They've got TCU on their heels right now. Petty, play action. Going to the end zone. Corey Coleman, touchdown! Touchdown, Corey Coleman! We've got a tie game at 58-58. Fourth and three. Boykin, going to loft one. Deep on the sideline. Broken up. Baylor's going to get it back. If he hits this, he'll be the biggest man on campus. He got it! 24 unanswered points. Unbelievable. Welcome to ESPN College Football Primetime, presented by Jimmy John's, part of ESPN's Rivalry Series, presented by Jiffy Lou. After a 45-minute weather delay due to lightning, we are ready for football. Raining still off and on, temperature in the high 30s, wind chill in the low 20s. For Baylor and TCU, so much at stake for the Bears. Still a chance at a Big 12 championship and a spot on the college football playoff, but they have to win tonight. And next week at home against Texas plus Oklahoma has to lose tomorrow night to Oklahoma State, a game that will be on ABC. And welcome to the booth alongside Brian Greasy. I'm Dave Pash. Tom Luganville will join us in a moment. Well, last year's epic 61-58 game in Waco, Brian, was all about quarterback play. This game's about the quarterbacks as well, but for a different reason, injuries. Uh, Trevon Boykin coming off an ankle injury, didn't play in their loss at Oklahoma last week. And meanwhile, Baylor is down to its third quarterback because of injuries. Chris Johnson making his first career start. Yeah, I think for Trevon Boykin, you weren't going to keep him off the field. The last game he's going to play in this stadium, how is that ankle going to respond? You see him in pregame, it looks tender. That high ankle sprain from two weeks ago in the Kansas game, how will he react? Will he be able to be the Trevon Boykin that we have come to see be so explosive outside the pocket? And you're right, for Chris Johnson, the first start you make in your college career is on the road in a rivalry game, and you have to wait 45 minutes for it to start. What's going through his head? And then on top of all of that, the elements today, the rain, the wind chill, as you mentioned, in the, in the low 20s. And we're going to test the mental toughness of Tom Luganville uh, down on the field today. So, uh, Tom, how is, the, how is the weather going to affect these guys with the football? Well, for two teams, Brian, that want to throw the football an awful lot, they're going to have to do it with a wet ball. Now, it's gotten colder, it's gotten windier, and the surface is really, really sloppy. So when you're holding a wet ball, you don't want to squeeze too hard. You want those fingertips to be relatively loose and to be able to have some space between your palm. If you see quarterbacks palming it and cupping it, they're probably going to lose control and it's going to take away from their accuracy. Now, watch Trevon Boykin. He will take the football and he'll switch and put his fingers on the seam as opposed to on the laces. He's a little bit more comfortable with that. So it's going to be very interesting to see if the rain picks up how these quarterbacks handle poor conditions. All right, Tom, grab that microphone tight. We'll be talking to you throughout the telecast. One could argue Baylor TCU, now the best college football rivalry in Texas. They meet again next. ESPN College Football, brought to you by Jiffy Lou. Experts around every corner to help you leave worry behind. Like that for a lot of these kids from Texas, as uh, Jaden Overcrome will get ready to kick it off with the temperature at 39 and the wind chill at 23. Chance of rain 100%. It's been raining off and on throughout the day. Baylor won the toss and elected to receive, so we'll get a good look at Chris Johnson, a sophomore from Bryan, Texas, about two and a half hours from Fort Worth, making his first collegiate start. TCU trying for its 10th win of the season, lost a heartbreaker last week at Oklahoma. Baylor won at Oklahoma State to keep its Big 12 title and college football playoff hopes alive. And it's a short kickoff. Chris Platt from the six yard line. And Platt with a running lane to the outside. Out near the 40 yard line. Great starting field position for the Baylor Bears. 
Chris Johnson in relief last week through a 39-yard touchdown pass in the third quarter to Jay Lee, then a 71-yard touchdown pass on the very next attempt to KD Cannon. He redshirted two years ago, played four games last year through four passes. Then in training camp this year, he was moved to wide receiver. He's got three catches on the season and was switched back to quarterback in October. He replaces Jarrett Stidham, who injured his ankle against Oklahoma State. Stidham could be back for the bowl game. Seth Russell started the season and played well before a neck injury ended his year. Shock Linwood is starting for Baylor. He was battling an ankle injury himself last week, and on the first play, he's out to the 43-yard line for a four-yard run brought down by Mike Tuaua. You know, the biggest difference for Chris Johnson is you, you're all week you know you're going to be the starting quarterback. It's very different than last week you come in an emergency situation with Stidham getting hurt. How does he react and how are his nerves? There's Linwood again, and he's out to the 47-yard line. It'll bring up third down and short. And the best way to get rid of the nerves of a young quarterback making his first start is to run the football. And we know that Art Bryles and Kendall Bryles in this Baylor unit, that's a primary issue. It's Linwood again, and he's short. Knocked down at the 48-yard line. Ty Summers on the stop of Shock Linwood. Leads the Big 12 in rushing, but Baylor going for it here on fourth down. The quarterback sneak, and it's close. Looks like he's got it based on where the head linesman is standing. Some pushing and shoving after the play. No surprise given... The fact that these two are rivals, things have become really bitter the last 12 months between these two, including the painting of the RG3 statue on the Baylor campus, and then the Baylor students uh, spray painting 6158 all over the TCU campus. Let's see if uh, Johnson was able to pick it up here. It was Ty Summers coming in there with the hit for TCU. They're going to measure, and I, you know I don't, I don't know that I like that to call from. Kendall Bryles, all Bryles, so early in the game. It's a rivalry game, and you've been pent up for 45 extra minutes in the locker room, and to come out in the first drive on your side of the field and go for it on fourth down, it's a risk. You got it, though. First down, Baylor. Art Bryles, in his eighth season, he turns 60 next week. Consecutive 11 win seasons. They tied for the Big 12 title last year, of course, left out of the college football playoff. They won the Big 12 two years ago. They need help to capture the 2015 Big 12 title. Need two wins and then also need Oklahoma to lose tomorrow night. Now they're going to review this further to see if indeed Johnson got the first down. This is really going to be hard to tell though. Of course you need indisputable video evidence beyond all doubt to overturn the ruling on the field. Yeah, and we see, you know, whether it's on the goal line or short yardage situations like this, there's so many bodies in there, this is rarely ever overturned. Because you can't see the ball. Yeah. you got to be able to see the ball for it to be enough evidence to overturn. It'll be interesting to track, you know, as we watch Chris Johnson rush for the first time. How much does he run the football in this game? That's kind of his strength, but he's the only healthy quarterback. After further review, the ruling on the field stands first down. It's Mike Defee, the referee. To you know, your point on Johnson being the only quarterback, his backup is a true freshman. That the coaches really don't even know who he is. Uh, we're talking to some of the, the Baylor folks. They know his name, Zach Benamon. They know he's from Aurora, Illinois, but that's about all they know. Well, I don't know that Art Bryles actually knew his name. <laughs> <laughs> they actually might move a receiver to quarterback. Uh, like Chris Johnson, if Johnson gets hurt, he's going to air it out here. Going for the top target for Baylor, and there's a penalty flag. Corey Coleman, one of the top receivers in all the college football, a finalist for the Bolitnikoff Award, was interfered with by Corey O'Mealy. O'Mealy was in good position, and corners are taught to run these receivers out of bounds as part of the technique. Pass interference, defense number three. Cut the receiver's path off to the football. 15-yard penalty, automatic, first down. You hear him say, cut the receiver's path off to the football. There's O'Meal. He's in, now he gets the arm bar, looks back for the football. I don't know about that one, Grease. I mean, I mean Coleman's got a hold of O'Meal's yeah. jersey. I that, think that's a bad call. That official couldn't see. 
that Corey Coleman had his hand on O'Mealy. It could have called the other way. So first down inside the 40 yard line. Play action. Johnson and Katie Cannon on the catch at the 25 for 11 yards and a first down. Well, Chris Johnson was our fifth-ranked quarterback coming out of the class in the dual threat category, but he wasn't a heavily recruited player. It was all raw athletic ability, something that Art Briles felt that they could mold, and now that molding starting to take shape as he gets his first start here tonight. And he's moving the team here. Penalty flag down. There was movement by Baylor. False start. Offense. Number 61. Five yard penalty. First down. No, Chris Johnson was not a heavily recruited player, guys, at quarterback. And most of Art Bryles' quarterbacks outside of Jarrett Stidham have not been highly touted guys. And that includes Robert Griffin III. Go back to Houston, you had Case Keenum. Seth Russell wasn't overly heavily recruited. So this player right here is getting his opportunity to use his athleticism and his arm talent here on his first start against TCU on the road. And he's going to throw it into the end zone here, and it's broken up and picked off. What a terrific play by Julius Lewis, a true freshman. There is a penalty flag down, though, in the backfield. A great interception by Lewis. They've had all kinds of injuries on Personal defense, foul. but it's Rushing coming back. Passer. Defense number 94. 15 yard penalty, automatic first down. Josh Carraway not only negates an interception, but gives Baylor the ball now in the red zone. Boy, you get a huge play from Julius Lewis and Carraway number 94. Just comes in late. It's two steps. I mean, that's pretty self explanatory. Every defensive lineman knows that you can't hit the quarterback with two steps. One step, you're okay. And he takes away from a great play by the true freshman. And Baylor has scored a touchdown in every opening drive this year. The only team in the FBS to do it. That almost went by the wayside. Johnson running here inside the 10. Knocked down near the first down marker by Nick Orr. And Baylor's so good to start games. One of the big reasons they're 9 and 1. They lead the country in total offense and scoring. And this is the area of the field where Chris Johnson at 240 running the football is such an advantage. It's second and short. Johnson slipped, but uh, did get the first down to the five. You see uh, that field chewed up a lot because of the rain. And again, we had a weather delay of 45 minutes due to lightning. First and goal. And here's Linwood. Puts the head down and gets to about the two yard line. Stood up by Chris Bradley. This TCU defense playing much better of late. They've had so many injuries. They lost six starters entering the season and then lost a bunch more due to injury during the season. Linwood is knocked down in the backfield for a loss. Denzel Johnson made the play along with Pearson for TCU, bringing up a third and goal. And that's a big reason why they're playing so much better, Dave, is Denzel Johnson coming down in that nickel linebacker position. He's been used a lot in the backfield by Gary Patterson, blitzing off the edge that time unaccounted for, gets a tackle for loss. So it's third down and goal from the three-yard line. And Chafin plows forward and gets stood up at the goal line. And they're going to say he didn't get in. It'll be fourth down for Baylor. It was Davion Pearson in the middle of that TCU defense, a preseason all Big 12 performer that made the stick. It was Pearson and then Traven Howard, the linebacker. And again, for the same reason that you can't really tell on the fourth down at midfield, if he got the enough yards, same thing here. You can't tell. And if you go for it on fourth and one at the 50, you're sh you know our Browse is going to go fourth and one at the one. Will it be another quarterback sneak with the 235 pound quarterback? The field was short of the goal line. The previous play is under further review. But to your point, if you can't see the ball, it's not going to be overturned. Devin Chafin, the ball carrier here. Got no shot there to see it. Well, 
Well, you give Traven Howard a ton of credit as well. You know, he moved from safety down to linebacker, and they lost both inside linebackers to injury. He's only 190 pounds playing the Mike linebacker on a defense for, for Gary Patterson. He's not afraid to stick his nose in there. And then he had Pearson who had his arm wrapped around the head of Chafe and had him in a headlock there as he was trying to keep him out of the end zone. After further review, the ruling on the field stands fourth down. I think this is the right call for Art Bryles to go for it here. In this kind of game, you can't. It'd be fascinating to watch these two coaches after a 61 58 game last year. How do they put a premium on points in this elements? And when it's raining like this and, and the field is wet, you don't know how many points you're going to be able to score. You're down here. I like going for it. I'm with you. I think you got to go for it here. You get inside the one. You've got an offensive line that should overpower this TCU defensive front. But you're right. If I'm Gary Patterson, I'm stacking both A gaps over the center, anticipating the quarterback sneak from the 240 pound quarterback. And big number 80, Laquan McGowan at 410 pounds, is lined up in the backfield. They'll hand it off. One motor make that chafing over the top, and he's in for the touchdown. The ball came out, but that was well after Chafin crossed the plane as Baylor scores again a touchdown in the opening drive. When and Chafin does a great job because Ty Summers, number 42, came unblocked. And Chafin just gets enough to get that ball across the plane. That's the seventh rushing touchdown for Devin Chafin. Shock Linwood started the game, but he's battling an ankle injury. The coaches told us we'll see Chafin, Johnny Jefferson, Terrence Williams as well at running back today. And then he had Chris Johnson. Basically, that's five different guys that will carry the football between the tackles. And the point after from Chris Callahan, who hit the game-winning field goal to make it 61-58 last year. Baylor on top. Thanks to a roughing the passer penalty by Josh Carraway that negated an interception by Julius Lewis. Bryles goes for it on fourth down, and the Bears score. Playoff if they win against Oklahoma State. If Oklahoma loses, Baylor's back in it. The Bears need to win tonight and win next week against Texas. They're off to a good start, leading 7 0. Raining again here in Fort Worth. We had a 45 minute delay due to Lightning. Kevontae Turpin, true freshman, very dangerous with the ball in his hands, and there he goes. And a nice tackle at the 36-yard line. Davion Hall. So Trevon Boykin is back. The FBS leader in total offense. Missed last week's loss to Oklahoma due to an ankle injury. He holds 19 school records. The Big 12 preseason offensive player of the year. He won the award last year, finished fourth in Heisman voting. He's a dual threat. Was a receiver himself a couple years ago before being converted back to quarterback. Yeah, and, and the question is, can he continue to be that dual threat in this game with that ankle? He looked ginger in warm-ups. Got a very good tailback. Aaron Green, high snap, and Boyd can get him. Hand it off on the delay. Green was very good in the hole at making defenders miss. Gets to the 44 for seven yards. Boykin, 29 touchdown passes on the year. Four of the nine interceptions came in their one loss against Oklahoma State. Yeah, and this is uh, this is going to be probably the toughest game for, for Trevon Boykin because he's going to have to operate from the pocket almost exclusively because of that ankle. And the question is, with Phil Bennett, defensive coordinator for Baylor, knowing he's going to be in the pocket, how can he get pressure on Trevon Boykin? He's got Kevante Turpin in the backfield with him here on second down, and Boykin will throw. Going to air it out. Jump ball. Overthrown. Incomplete. Intended for Emmanuel Porter and a late penalty flag is thrown. We saw those jump balls a ton in the game last year in Waco. Ryan Reed was in coverage that time for the Bears on Emmanuel Porter who is becoming one of the go-to receivers with Josh Dotson out for the season due to a wrist injury. Pass interference. Defense number nine. 15 yard penalty. Automatic. First down. Ryan Reed will be targeted a lot in this football game. A year ago, he went one on one with Josh Dotson. This year will be Porter, as you mentioned, because of the injury to Dotson. Porter missed six games himself this season, so he's just getting back healthy, and that's a good call. 
Seven catches on the season for Porter started last week against Oklahoma as TCU is in Baylor territory at the 40 yard line. Boykin a senior from right here in Dallas. And Boykin as a defender fell down. Jarrison Stewart gets the first down inside the 30 to the 26 for 14 yards. You know, watching Trevon Boykin in both warm-up sessions, he certainly wasn't as fleet of foot as you'd expect him to be, and he's stiff in the lower body. If Baylor cannot rush the passer, they're going to be in trouble because he won't have to move like he normally likes to. He moves here, looking for a running lane, and down he goes to the 25, getting one yard. And that's a perfect example of what Lou just talking about right there. Normally, Trevon Boykin, when he gets to that second level, nobody catches him. We, we've seen him do amazing things when he gets outside the pocket. The run against West Virginia comes to mind where he got a high five from Dana Olgerson. Hmm. But he's going to have to adjust his game. And that will probably be the biggest challenge for him, as well as Doug Meacham, Sonny Cumbie, calling plays for him from the pocket. Boykin, another pass play. He's going to fire into the end zone. It's caught. Did he hang on? He did. Touchdown, Stewart. The first touchdown of Jarrison Stewart's career. The true freshman hauls it in. Rain is coming down in sheets. But that does not affect Trevon Boykin. It's just a little pick route with Stewart. He runs a wheel, and he gets wide open on the linebacker, Taylor Young. That's a mismatch. 30th touchdown pass of the season for Boykin. As the receiver able to secure it all the way to the ground. Point after by Oberchrome ties the game at seven. Who knows, maybe we get another 61-58 game. <laughs> the elements don't bother these two teams. Presented by Jimmy John's Freaky Fast Sandwiches. And in part by Buick, proud partner of the NCAA. Windy, rainy, and cold here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And the National Championship Trophy presented by Dr. Pepper has made its way to Fort Worth for tonight's game. Baylor hoping to be in the college football playoff. Seventh this week. They were number 10 last week, but then won at Oklahoma State 45-35. Baylor and TCU tied at seven. Six minutes gone by here in the first quarter. This will be a touchback. Zamora takes a knee. It will come out to the 25. Let's check in with Tom down on the field. Fellows, with conditions like this, the officials give each team, particularly tempo teams, the option to play with a wet ball throughout the course of the game or a dry ball. Both coaching staffs, Gary Patterson and Art Browns, have chosen to go with a wet ball. Now, what that means is if both teams are running at a high tempo with pace, they don't necessarily get to interchange the ball from the sideline. They're not always going to have a dry ball, particularly if the play ends between the numbers. And so they're at the mercy of having to deal with the elements to the utmost, and they can't change to slow it down during the course of the game. They pick one or the other, and they live with it. Wow, that's really interesting. These, both these coaches value the pace on offense more so than the risk of turning it over. And here's a big hole for Jefferson across the 30 to the 32. So that's a seven yard run before Traven Howard makes the tackle. So, so you'll see that center judge is now going to spot the ball. And because of this pace, they won't, won't get a dry ball in the game. Jefferson again has the first down. An ankle tackle made to stop a big play by Montreal Wilson. And you see the center judge come in. So that's been the same ball. Now the third play and it's just continually getting rained on. Now Johnson to throw, looking deep, going to fire it, incomplete, trying to hit Cannon. Good coverage by Nick Orr. So when you consider you've got a wet surface, you got wet hands from the center, the pants of the, of the uniforms are wet, and then every time the ball carrier goes down, yeah. he's cupping it with a wet a jersey. Grease, this is going to be very difficult as these conditions continue to worsen. Well, and if I'm going to throw the ball, I'm going to throw it early in the drive before the ball gets wet because that last throw in the third play of the series, that wet ball certainly affected Chris Johnson's accuracy. No, nope. run it here on the delay. Jefferson with a first down and more. Breaks a tackle at the 40. 
They finally knock him down inside the 20. Johnny Jefferson with a huge run for Baylor. You know, Shock Linwood tweaked an ankle and a knee last week in the game, and Johnny Jefferson is going to see more carries in this football game. He's a little bit faster, more explosive even than Shock Linwood. That was a 45-yard run by Jefferson. Johnson throwing, and to the 10-yard line is Jay Lee. And harder to throw throw ball uh, on a short route or a deep pass with that wet football. Well, they're all hard when the ball's slippery, but uh, certainly when you got to be more accurate on the short throws, uh, it's difficult. Sometimes the, the long throw is easier because you just throw it as far as you can. Quarterback run Johnson runs over a defender and picks up the first down. Nick Orr giving up about 60 pounds to the quarterback Chris Johnson. And this is all new for TCU defensively. They don't know anything about Chris Johnson. They know he's a big kid, but they don't know how he's going to react in the hole. He put his shoulder down. Here's Chafin. Another touchdown for Devin Chafin. He's got both Baylor scores. 17 plays. Baylor's run offensively. 14 of them on the ground. You can see Art Briles' points of emphasis this week. In a rivalry game on the road with your third string quarterback in bad weather, it's going to be who's the toughest up front. We're going to run the football in between the tackles. Seven play, 75 yard drive in a minute 27 for the top scoring team in the country. If they end up leading the country in scoring, it'd be the third straight year, and they'd be the first team since BYU from 79 to 81 to accomplish that feat. They've already got 14 points. In half of the first quarter, both touchdowns by Devin Chafin. State then at 3.30 on ESPN if Michigan State beats Penn State. It'll be the Spartans in Iowa in the Big Ten Championship game. Take a look at uh, tonight's home field advantage presented by Quicken Loans. Michigan's only home loss was that crazy finish against Michigan State. And the last time Ohio State lost on the road, Urban Meyer wasn't even their coach. That's when Luke Fickle was the interim coach after Jim Trestle was let go in 2011. So Baylor now with the most two-minute touchdown drives, 46 on the season. They're up 14-7 on TCU. Temperatures in the high 30s, wind chill in the low 20s. No more lightning, though, since it struck about two hours ago. Here's Kevante Turpin. Had a good return the first time, trying to get to the outside. And Hall had an angle on him, so he stepped out at the 33-yard line. TC was at 20 starters injured for Gary Patterson's squad this year, including Ranthony Tejada, outstanding corner. Aaron Curry just got hurt recently. Here are the offensive starters, most notable Josh Dotson, the nation's leader in receiving yards per game due to a wrist injury, plus Joey Hunt at center, Jamel Naff at left guard. They've had a total of 30 freshmen, 15 true freshmen and 15 redshirt freshmen that have played. That's the second most total in the country of freshmen behind Rice with 31. Yet they got nine wins. That's an outstanding job by Gary Patterson. I know the expectations were high this season, and you don't expect to lose that many guys. And Boyk into the air, coming off a touchdown pass. Another deep shot here. What a grab by Porter. And the defender... Ryan Reed all over him, and he went up high to pull it down for 32 yards. Well, you show Josh Dotson on the sidelines. This is the guy that they need to step into his position at that X receiver, Manuel Porter, who is taller than Dotson. He's 6'4", 210 pounds, and has the ability to go up and get the football. That matchup, Porter on Reed, will be something to keep track of all game long. 6'4", 210 pounds from Dallas, a sophomore. They're inside the Baylor 35. That's Turpin running into the backfield here. Boykin, Porter in traffic, made a catch, got crunched right at the first down marker by Reed and Waz. Okay, keep feeding him. Yeah, keep feeding him. He's, he's hot. Get him involved in the game. Like we said, he hasn't played a whole lot of football. Only seven catches coming into this game. They need Porter to make plays if they're going to continue to keep pace on the scoreboard with Baylor. Second down and a yard. Aaron Green, who's got 1,100 yards rushing on the season in the backfield with Boykin. 
But Boykin outside the pocket, a flag down, and Boykin did not get the first down. It's going to be a penalty on TCU. Yeah, TCU, you mentioned all those injuries. They've got two injuries up front on the offensive line as well, center and left guard. Oh. Offense number 68, 10 yard penalty, second down. That's on Joseph Noteboom, the right tackle, but Joey Hunt, their starting center, is out. Jamal Naff out as well, and this time on the right tackle, Noteboom, be something to keep track of. You got a gimpy quarterback and two offensive linemen out, Dave. Uh, how is the protection going to hold up against the defensive front for Baylor with Oakman and Billings and Palmer? That is active to the quarterback and Billings right there 75 and white he's their best player on defense Boykin airing it out into the end zone and out of bounds it was Turpin and the back judge says it's incomplete <laughs> that was a heck of a catch I don't care if he was inbounds or not that was an outstanding catch he's got such great speed Wow. Couldn't tell that right knee, That's but close. that was close, a lot closer than, than you think. He definitely caught the football. The question is, is that right field knee or right pass. foot in? The play is under further review. It's hard to tell what, what, when he secured the ball, when he had possession, was that knee off the ground. Ruling the field is an incompletion. That's a lot closer than it looked live. It looked like he may have dragged that right toe. They're going to take a look. Again, you need indisputable video evidence, and you got the rain in front of you, too, here yeah. for our replay official, Don Caprol, trying to make the call. <laughs> the elements affecting the replay officials, yeah. too. They're not immune. Let's see that right foot. I, now, does he have possession? Has he secured it yet, though? Is that toe? I mean, I think he, he catches the football. Wow, and maintains possession to the ground, and he's got the football, rolls over. He's still got the football. The question, question is that right toe. Yeah, and the, uh, it, when he had possession of it, was his toe still on the ground, or did it come up? Which, you know, we're sitting here going back and forth, with, which means to us that there's not indisputable video evidence to overturn this. Right. But you and I have seen some this year. We <laughs> thought there was no way they'd get overturned based on the video evidence, and we were shocked. That was in the Pac-12. What an effort by Turpin, though. The speed to get by those guys and then to make that catch on the back end. You know, we were talking with Sonny Cumbie this week, and they have what they call Turp touches. They try to get Cavante Turpin at least 10 or 12 touches in the game. Gary Patterson knows he's a true freshman, but he's such a dynamic playmaker that he uses him on offense and special teams. He's from Monroe, Louisiana, true freshman at a punt return for a touchdown against Kansas. He has seven receiving touchdowns in the season. He's already returned two kickoffs in this game. And without Dotson and the other guys that we, we showed you, uh, they, they need Turpin to make big plays. And that was a great play, but I, I'd be surprised if this gets overturned. After further review, the ruling on the field stands incomplete pass. And that's because, you know, again, had they ruled on the field touchdown, I don't think yeah. you would have seen video replay overturn it either. So it's third down and 11. Remember, there was a holding penalty in Joseph Noteboom. But I think this is four down territory without question for Trevon Boykin, especially the rain coming down. They're not going to attempt a 48 yard field goal. So Although they do have a great kicker, Jaden Overcrom. He made a 57 yard earlier this year. Three man rush for Baylor. Boykin steps up and runs at the 30 and heads out of bounds. So he doesn't get the first down. It would be about a 48 yard field goal from here, or it's fourth down and six. And Boykin going to stay on the field. So you like this decision by Gary Patterson? I, yeah, I Baylor has gone for it already and fourth yeah, down and converted twice. I think you have to. It's unfair to put Oberchrome out there. You know, I would say coming into the game, anything under 40-yard field goals you feel good with. But over that, I mean, it's dicey. Fourth down and seven. It looks like Baylor's going to bring pressure here. No safety in the middle of the field for the Bears. You get one-on-one -on, -one on the outside with Porter and Reed. 
Now they back off and rush four. Boykin slings it incomplete. Not on the same page with Stewart, the receiver. And so Baylor takes over on downs. Great look on defense from Phil Bennett. There he is talking to Sells, the safety. But look at pre-snap. There's no safety back here. But then once they snap the ball, they're going to drop out and play a zone. And it fools Trevon Boykin. It's great look from Phil Bennett with a defense that is getting better and better as the season has gone on, pressuring with four, confusing the quarterback. And Oklahoma State did that to Trevon Boykin as well. And he got four turnovers from him. Phil Bennett, the longtime defensive coordinator, he lives on turning the football over 22 times they've done it this season. That's fourth in the conference, and they got Trevon Boykin. So Chris Johnson making his first collegiate start. Hands it off to Shock Linwood. Breaks one tackle, but then spun down in the backfield. Denzel Johnson makes another play. He's got 11 tackles for a loss now in the season. A loss of one on the play. And Johnson slips, and down he goes. We've seen a couple players. Trevon Blanchard on defense slipped and gave up a play. This time, it's Johnson, and you got to you got to be aware. You can't make these huge strides. You see how he tries to make that huge stride there, and the turf just comes out from underneath. And you got to when it's wet and it's slippery, you got to take smaller steps, and you'll keep your feet. So it's third down and 14. Johnson. And nothing there. Pearson's got a hold of him and takes him down to force a punt. Well, you take a look at this turf now. The surface is really becoming saturated. And if you go back to the game versus Kansas, Trevon Boykin got injured as his foot got caught in the turf. So now this thing's starting to come up a little bit. Cleats are sliding all over the place, and it's only going to get worse. This is a heavy downpour right now, and now field position's about to flip in TCU's favor as a result. And we're not expected to get freezing rain. The temperature is supposed to stay in the upper 30s, but again, that wind chill in the low 20s, and it continues to pour here in Fort Worth. Turpin is the deep man for the punt by Galitz. And it's secured for the fair catch. There was contact afterwards. I don't know if there was enough for a penalty. I think Baylor gave him enough room. It was a 31-yard punt, no return. Yeah, the long snapper gets down there, and then he just gets pushed in the back by one of his own guys. But he got pushed by a TCU yeah, player. That's a good no call. You know, with the weather like this, the guys that, that probably have a, a really tough job are the kickers. You know, those punters catching the football. They're over there on the sideline freezing. Their hands are getting wet, and they got to go out there and catch the ball. So keep an eye when these teams punt. The snapper and the, the kicker catching the ball will be a, a big key in the game. Boykin sidearms it out to Nixon. And Sean Nixon now 37 catches on the season. He missed all last year with injury, had a red shirt. But with the, all those injuries, a wide receiver, he's a running back that they're throwing the ball a lot to now, and he gets two yards there. Oh, and he was tackled by Teon Sells, who the backup safety who's playing in place of Orion Stewart, who is out again this week. The emotional leader in that secondary for Phil Bennett. But we've already seen Phil Bennett trust his defensive secondary with some complicated looks, blitz, and zone. So Sells is more than capable. They get a lot of time off the play clock. Boykin with time and throws that one out of bounds. Trying to hit Nixon. Trevon Blanchard was running with the receiver that time. So it's third down and eight. You mentioned Blanchard had a heck of a football game against Oklahoma 14 tackles three tackles for loss a sack an interception he's that wild card on this defense you know he's playing the position Colin Brent's played last year they ask a lot of him in coverage but also getting after the quarterback and stopping the run he's got to do it all so many people talk about Baylor's offense for good reason but they do have some very good players on defense John Oakman we haven't said his name yet Andrew Billings, we talked about Blanchard as well. Third down and eight, the play clock and one. They did not get it off. Penalty marker down. Why do you think they're taking so much time off the play clock here on this Probably possession? Delay a game. Offense, number two. 
Five yard penalty, third down. It's not like Gary Patterson, since he installed this offense a couple of years ago, wants to take the play clock down that much. Doesn't do it well, very often. Yeah, well, Gary doesn't get involved in the offense. It's uh, Sonny Cumbie and, and Doug Meacham exclusively. And uh, there's a lot going on out there right now for Teron Boyd. He's trying to overcome that ankle, the, the elements, and get the plays called and just lost sight of the play clock. So third down and 12. Here comes Billings. Look out. Down goes Boykin. At the 22, lost his footing, and again playing with an ankle injury as Billings gets the sack to force a TCU punt. Uh, we talked about Joey Hunt, the uh, center out. Austin Slotman is the center right here. If you're going to match him up one-on-one -on -one with Andrew Billings, you're going to lose. And that's just part of that is Slotman being outmatched, but part of that scheme, too. You can't leave a center playing only a second game of the year with one of the best defensive linemen in all of college football and think you're going to win. Links Hawthorne is deep. This is an excellent punt. Hawthorne muffs it. TCU appeared to jump on it at the 30 yard line. That was a great punt from Ethan Perry. Gave his coverage unit time to get down the field and they get the football. 48 yard punt. It was muffed and recovered at the 30 yard line. By TCU, it's Davis Devereaux. Check that Paul Whitmill with the recovery. And that's listen be the starting wide receiver that got down there first. Great effort. You ask your starters to do everything and listen be getting down on punt coverage you never know when that's going to happen and mistake by Hawthorne. Look at the last couple of games turnover margin for Baylor after a great start minus five the last couple of games but they won last week despite the turnovers at Oklahoma State. TCU ball now at the Baylor 30 trailing by seven late in the first quarter. Here's Aaron Green. And Oakman can't make the play on Green, and he's knocked down at the 16-yard line after a gain of four or five. Aaron Green playing his final game here at TCU, final home game. He's a transfer from Nebraska. Grew up in San Antonio, a thousand-yard season. He's a he's a dynamic playmaker. Just watching his last three games of film, you know, you see him with a jump cut in particular. He made. Oklahoma State and Oklahoma look silly with some of those jump cuts. The question is, with this kind of footing, will he be able to use his strongest weapon? Second down and five. Boykin pulls it back in the pass, way overthrown. Intended for Porter. Third down. Well, that's the first time we've seen Trevon Boykin. You see him rubbing his hands, lose control of the football. But going back to Aaron Green, you talk about the jump cut ability, Brian. That's where his short, choppy steps really help him on this surface because he stays balanced and under control, and he doesn't overreach, which causes you to slip and pull up the turf. Yeah, quick feet. Uh, some of the best backs uh, that I've ever seen have been around. have had those quick feet, and they're able to keep their balance. And Aaron Green, they need to get him established. They can't rely solely on the pass. All right, Baylor showing that same look. This time they bring pressure on third down. Jump ball, and it's picked off inside the five by Howard. And Howard takes it back to the 17. We saw this in the fourth quarter last year from Phil Bennett in this game. All out pressure and the answer from TCU was to throw the fade. Well, they bring it. Baylor anticipates it and Xavier Howard knows exactly when to turn around and time his jump and gets the interception. That's the fifth interception of the season for Howard. And so that's two opportunities inside the Baylor 35. And the Horned Frogs come away with nothing. They trail 14-7. And college football playoff hopes alive, leading 14-7 at TCU. 111th meeting between these two schools. But only the second where both have been ranked. The first was last year, 61-58. Baylor won in Waco after trailing by 21 in the fourth quarter. They're going to run it here. Corey Coleman getting the call on a rush. And he's out to the 33 for about 14 yards. 
Seth Russell took over for Bryce Petty, started the year, went 7-0, and and then injured his neck against Iowa State. He's out for the year. Jared Stidham started three games, injured his ankle against Oklahoma State. He could return for the Bears should there be a bowl game or a playoff game as uh, Johnson throws it deep, and this is intercepted by Nick Orr. We saw this last week in the second half from Chris Johnson. Yes, he threw two touchdowns and they beat Oklahoma State, but he also threw an interception late just like this. So you see over the top, it's too deep, and it's clear that it's too deep. You can't just throw the ball down on a fade with a safety back there. It turns into a punt. Those are the decisions. You want to be aggressive, and you want to do what you do when you're Baylor, which is throw the ball down the field to Katie Cannon and Jay Lee, but you also have to be smart and read the defense and not give the football away. So that's two interceptions now in the season for Johnson to go along with two touchdowns. And TCU gets it back. How about three straight turnovers? You have the muff punt by Baylor and then the interception by Boykin, who's just one of six after a hot start. And now a turnover on the interception thrown by Johnson. I don't think that's going to change, Dave, with the way it's, I mean, it's coming down hard now. So does TCU try to keep it on the ground here? They will. Kyle Hicks off the right side. And Hicks slammed down by Oakman. Sells there first. It's a gain of five. I really think Doug Meacham needs to get this run game going. Whether it's Hicks or whether it's Green, you're not going to get the production on the ground from number two. Uh, so you have got to establish a running game if you're going to win this football game. There's Doug Meacham. You got Sonny Cumbie in the boot, the co offensive coordinators. They're not going to run a play here. That's the end of the first quarter. Trevon Boykin with the touchdown pass, but he also threw an interception. His final home game coming off an ankle injury. Trying to get TCU its 10th win of the season and beat its rival. But the Baylor Bears lead 14 7 after one in Fort Worth. Hands field goal nets. Allstate makes contributions to participating universities' general scholarship funds for each field goal and extra point kick. To date, Allstate has contributed millions in scholarship funds. We welcome you back to ESPN College Football Primetime, presented by Jimmy Johns, part of ESPN's Rivalry Series, presented by Jiffy Lou. It's 14 7 Baylor. So far, the difference is the rush game only as a sack there by Jamal Palmer on Boykin. They had only 15 rushing yards in the first quarter and a loss on that second down play of seven yards. Yeah, we Third mentioned 11. Joey Hunt out, Jamal Naff out, and that put Matt Pryor 64 in at right guard, and Jamal Palmer just too quick for Pryor. You know, this, this defensive front playing without Bo Blackshear uh, tonight, they're playing a three-man front because they don't have the numbers on the defensive line without Blackshear, but Palmer and Billings already have made plays in the backfield. And we talked about the TCU injuries on defense. Baylor has plenty of them. Boykin, a ton of time to throw. Has to try to check it down, and it's incomplete. Looking to hit Kyle Hicks. So it's fourth down. Another punt coming here for the Horned Frogs. You know, you see Trevon Boykin. He comes up a little bit hobbled, but he tried just at the last second on that second down to try and back out. He just can't do it. And so the hidden yardage plays, the improvised plays, that the spectacular plays that he makes on his own, are being hampered not only by an injury but by the surface as well and it negatively affects the production of this offense. We've seen it affect the kicking game too Tom. Baylor coming after it and they got close. Hawthorne who muffed the punt wants no part of this one. It's on the other hash mark near the 30 yeah, yard line. That, that could have been fielded easily by Hawthorne but he just ran away. That might be their strategy the remainder of the game is not try to field these punts. Rival South Carolina. Florida, Florida State at 7.30. College football presented by Hilton Hotels. Both games you can also watch on the Watch ESPN app. So in the first quarter, only two completions, but really, uh, Baylor ran the ball so well. They had over 100 rushing yards in that first quarter. That was the difference. TCU can't run the ball. Baylor can. And here's Shock Linwood getting to the outside across the 40. Pushed out by Ty Summers after 12 yards. So... Chris Johnson making his first start, and his two predecessors are here, both out with injury. Seth Russell down on the field. Jarrett Stidham in the booth. Again, Stidham could return for a bowl game for Baylor. Johnson, a sophomore, going to hand it off. Linwood with a big hole. It's another first down. 
saw in the pregame. This is Chris Johnson. He's got Jared Stidham's number three there and Seth Russell's number 17 on his wristband. That's really cool. These guys are tight in that quarterback room, and you'll see that very often. Third string quarterback come in and put the number of those guys on his wristband. Lynn Wood, and they finally get him for a short gain. It was Traven Howard and Davion Pearson. It's a testament. It Sorry, Dave. It's a testament to, to Chris Johnson that uh, you know it's not about him. He's not coming in and say, okay, hey, it's my chance to shine. And I'm gonna come out. I'm gonna you know, win more snaps and all this. No, he's out here, and first thing he does in his first start as a collegiate athlete is to honor the two guys that came before him. I think that's real cool. Getting the help of a solid run game so far. This pass incomplete. It was dropped by Davion Hall. You talk about that close knit group, Grease. I was talking to Seth Russell before the game. He said he just wants to help Chris Johnson out. He knows that he came in as a quarterback, got beat out, moved to wide receiver, comes back in at quarterback. Seth Russell just wants to be a positive influence on Chris Johnson and ensure that Chris Johnson feels comfortable in this role. Well, they just lost their center. Kyle Fuller just left the game. And as the quarterback Johnson tries to run, he lost the ball, and it's picked up by TCU. Josh Caraway on the run. They're not going to catch him. Caraway with a TCU touchdown. You mentioned those three turnovers, Dave, to start the game. Now Chris Johnson with his seventh rush. We got to protect the football all the way to the ground. He's got it's wrapped up with his legs. And Traven Howard, number 32, rips the ball out. That ball is out. That's a fumble. And Josh Carraway, who gave up the first touchdown, if we remember, on that personal foul, late hit on the quarterback, is in position and makes a play for Gary Patterson. Great job by the official, too, to catch it because if they rule him down and it's overturned, which now, as you look at the replay, you can see clearly the ball is out. Then you don't get the return, but because they let it go, the official thought it was out, called it a fumble. The touchdown will stand as well. That left knee is still up, and the ball is out. Yep. Traven Howard and Montrell Wilson on the hit, and Josh Caraway picks it up, shows speed. He had a big game last week, two and a half sacks against Oklahoma. Made a mistake on the first drive with that, that personal yeah. foul. Yeah. After further review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. Fumble, touchdown. Uh, you know how detailed Gary Patterson is, especially with his defense. And in a game like this, you're coaching your guys on defense. If you get one guy to wrap up, the second and third guy to the football got to go for the football strip it out because the conditions are going to give you ample opportunity to turn the ball over already four turnovers here two by Johnson an interception and now a fumble over Cromon for the extra point to tie it 14 even this probably won't be easy given the rain and the conditions with the wind and also the footing but Pretty smooth there. Ties the game at 14. Well, Chris Johnson's first collegiate start not going so well. He's throwing a pick. Now he coughs it up. And Caraway takes it the distance to tie the ball game. That's the chicken sandwich. Our crew dinner at Roos Chris in the hotel last night. And our, our guys work so hard. We appreciate it. James Christopher and Wes Archer, Greg Thomas. Greg was styling last night. He had that shirt on last night. He was looking good. Wes there on the camera. He's <laughs> talking about these guys working hard out in the elements. Yeah, James. James, yeah. Luganville only had three plates last night. I was disappointed. I thought he might go for the fourth. That's why he wasn't pictured. We <laughs> edited that part. For yeah, you don't want to put him on, on television eating in any way, shape, or form. Hey, Dave, you want to come join these elements? <laughs> oh, this booth is nice and warm, Tom. Okay, I just wanted to make it dry. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> All right, so we're in Tom's head. Is TCU in Chris Johnson's head right now? Well, Chris Johnson needs to get out of his own way here. Stop turning the football over. Protect it. And a pooch. This is live, and again, it's slippery. And Zamora slides to the 26-yard line. I like that by TCU. 
Every special team's play is going to be exciting the rest of this game with uh, the way that the elements are. But, you know, the, the Baylor's got to get back to what they were doing so well, running the football between the tackles. And talking with Kendall Bryles this week, you know, he said, I don't, I don't know how much we're going to run Chris Johnson because he's our only healthy quarterback. We can't afford to get him hurt. He's already got eight rushes tonight. Kendall Bryles is probably going to get Shock Linwood, Chafin, Johnny Jefferson back involved in this drive. He's got a center, Kyle Fuller, back on the field. Fuller was not out there on that last play. He went to the sideline, and Blake Blackmar was in the game. So far, Johnson has only thrown five passes. And here's Jefferson straight ahead. Ripped down at the 31 yard line. Tackled by Bryson Henderson, a handful on the ground for Johnny Jefferson. You think about Baylor, you think of speed down the field. You don't think of this offensive line, but it is a strength. Jefferson gets drilled by Ty Summers. Now Pearson also getting off a block. So maybe a gain of one, third down. To your point in this offensive line, their left tackle, Spencer Drango, he's an Outland Trophy finalist. Number 58 there. Jefferson upended. Traven Howard, who has moved from strong safety in the middle of the season, he's their third different starting middle linebacker because of all those injuries, makes the play. Well, take a look. He has to avoid a lineman coming around. It's Pat Colbert, 69, avoids it. Between Ty Summers and Traven Howard, those two guys have stepped into that Mike linebacker position for Gary Patterson. With all the injuries they went through, this defense was on the verge of breaking down. Those two guys have really solidified and been the glue that's kept Gary Patterson's defense together this season. They keep the momentum going after the fumble recovery for a touchdown, and here's a bad snap. Galitz gets the punt away, and it's a really good kick. Fair caught at the 27 yard line. I think it was a good just snap. dropped it. Yeah, yeah. it was just, just Galis just dropped it. And you got to focus. You have to have supreme focus. And when you're punting the football, you got to catch it like anybody else does. Had to move a little bit to his left, but not much there, but did a good job to scoop and get rid of it. E. Baylor turnovers here in the first half. We're tied at 14. TCU with a first and 10 from his 27 yard line. Trevon Boykin leading the country. Total offense, yards per game. And there was not a running back there, so Boykin loses yardage. Trying to hand it off to Aaron Green, but he wasn't there. Our lows never stop improving. How Gary Patterson has improved. Uh, they were 4 and 8 two years ago. He changes the offense. He goes to the spread and brings in a pair of new coordinators in Sonny Cumbie and Doug Meacham. Yeah, I think that, that was the right call for Gary Patterson. You see Sonny Cumbie in the middle there. And, you know, the thing I've, I've noticed now two years with these two coordinators, and there's Doug Meacham, is that the offense and defense now are playing more as a unit, more as a team. They're not individual units, which I think is important. Here's Turpin off the right side. He gets stood up and shoved out by Taylor Young. It'll bring up a third and long. But what I mean by that is I think that Gary Patterson has learned how to coach with these two offensive coordinators you know defensively they're going to be put under a little bit more pressure because if they go three and out in the up-tempo offense they're going to be on the field a little bit more but I think they've got found that balance now and Gary Patterson knows what to expect from Meacham and Cumbie on the offense and Grace they had to find the right quarterback for this system the right quarterback happened to be a guy playing receiver two years ago Trevon Boykin and last year he ends up finishing fourth and Heisman consideration here's a screen pass to Kyle Hicks and Hicks gets the first down out to the 40 yard line. That's a great call when the weather is the way it is to get the screen game going. You see the offensive line. You don't have to block Andrew Billings, their best player. You get Schlotman out front, Folds out front, and get the ball in the hands of Hicks with an easy completion. First third down conversion for either team here in the first half. We haven't had a lot of third down plays to begin with. Just shy of the 40 yard line. Green. Uh, you see those jump cuts. Beautiful. Moves in the hole, and it's a gain of eight yards. 
No, Dave, I've heard you reference, you know, Trevon Boykin was a receiver two years ago. Um, other players that have come in at different positions and changed. That's Gary Patterson's recruiting philosophy. If they can run and they can play in space, he'll figure out where to play them once he gets them. That's the beauty of this team and how it's built. They want athletes. They want team speed. They'll build around their philosophy once the kids get on campus. I don't think he knew that Javon Boykin was going to be as good as quarterback as he's been. Hicks has the first down. He gets stoned by Teon Sells, but he does move the chains into Baylor territory. The one thing, though, when it comes to recruiting for TCU that you got to be so impressed with is with the injuries that have occurred with this roster and the depth that all of a sudden has manifested itself. If this was five years ago and this was a team that was still in the Mountain West Conference, there's no way they could have survived it. That's how far they've come in a short period of time of building a talented roster with no drop-off as a result of injuries. When you go back to a handful of years ago, Andy Dalton was a quarterback. Obviously a lot different offense with Dalton, the quarterback, now starring for the Bengals. Aaron Green slammed down by Blanchard. No gain. When you take a look at the recruiting classes for both Baylor and TCU, and you see the sheer numbers uh, over the last few years, look at the number of high-caliber players that have come out of the ESPN 300 rankings for both Baylor and TCU. But maybe more importantly, there's still a lot of four-star caliber players that weren't in the ESPN 300 that are, are on both of these rosters. And so you see why the natural progression with both of these rosters have competed on a national level with everybody that they take the field against the caliber of player has dramatically increased Tom the right guard Matt Pryor just uh, went to the sideline with an injury so Patrick Morris is in for him we'll see what happens here on second and ten as green slips and down at the 47 for a loss of three it's third and long bad footing there for TCU when we talk about distance in terms of your recruiting pool and where you got to go to get players we touched on Nebraska several weeks ago on the challenges in recruiting to the University of Nebraska you don't necessarily see those challenges with TCU and Baylor look at the model and look at the number of miles to just TCU in particular has to go Gary Patterson and his staff can throw a rock outside of their office and hit a recruitable player so that gives you huge advantages within your state and you don't even have to leave not only the state in many instances the city it's become arguably the best college football rivalry in Texas 111th meeting as Boykin heads out of bounds no running room it's fourth down and they're gonna have to punt the football think about it these two schools at one point were both located in Waco it goes back to the 1800s yeah. when these two teams started to play each other and Back when they were both in the Southwest Conference and the Big 12 was expanding, they took Baylor instead of TCU. That still smarts the TCU fan base. They, they did not like that. The governor, they felt like the governor, Ann Richards, had something to do with it. And, and this rivalry has now gotten a little bit chippy, especially after 61-58 last year. And a lot of uh, spray paint in both <laughs> schools. As uh, Hawthorne got out of the way of that one again. And so TCU... And Baylor tied at 14. Midway fitting. Coach Corso said 9 a.m. as uh, Herbie will call the uh, Oklahoma Oklahoma State game with Chris Fowler and ABC 8 Eastern tomorrow night. Here in Fort Worth, TCU and Baylor tied at 14. Baylor trying to keep its hopes alive for a Big 12 championship. It needs Oklahoma to lose tomorrow night. Plus, the Bears have to win this game and then beat Texas next week. Here's Chris Johnson, just his sixth pass attempt of the game. And it's caught by Katie Cannon right at the first down marker. We talked about the rivalry. 61-58 was the score last year. And we're told that this is coincidence. You buy that? <laughs> I love it. I don't care if it's coincidence or not. I love it. You know, you put those two guys together. That's two of the starting offensive linemen, Drango and, and uh, Gerald Broxton. Corey Coleman taken down for no gain. They did pick up the first down in the last play. It's no, there's no there's no question that uh, Art Browse likes to you know rub it in a little bit. I, I don't know if that was planned or not, but those two guys are depending on this offensive line. We talked a little bit about it, but Art Browse is a physical guy. We know he's an emotional guy and he wants to establish a line of scrimmage and the offensive line is where it starts. High pass and boy if uh, Julius Lewis was paying attention he would have picked that off. So it's third down and ten. They're starting to their second and ten. They're starting to throw the ball here. Now it is third down. Excuse me. Yeah, when you when you try to fake and then get that ball out, the quarterback's not able to get his hands on the laces, Dave. That's what Tom was talking about in the pregame. 
And when you don't have your, your finger on the laces on a wet ball, it's almost impossible to throw it accurately. So they've come out throwing the ball here on this possession as Johnson's on the run. And that's a great catch, but short of the first down, Katie Cannon. It'll be fourth down and five. Katie Cannon had a great game last week, over 200 yards. And you're right, he comes down with that football. Great catch. But they're well short. They're going to punt fourth down in about five. It's, a, it's a, a struggle for receivers in games like this because these receivers, Lee, Cannon, Corey Coleman, they like to get their rhythm. They like to run downfield and make splash plays, but it's just not going to happen when it's wet out like this. So they've got to keep their, their heads about it. This is Galitz's third punt of the game. He had 29 all season, the second fewest in college football. Fair catch by Turpin. Let's take a look at Phil Bennett defensively. They've gotten to inside the head of Trevon Boykin. This was a fourth down. They show an all-out blitz, and then they pop out, and they play a zone behind it, which fools Boykin. He throws the ball into traffic, and it's an incompletion and a, and a turnover on downs. Then they come back. The next series, same look, all out pressure, and they bring the blitz. And that tells Trevon Boykin to throw the fade, but Xavier and Howard is in perfect position to intercept the football. Great example of Phil Bennett and how he mixes up his all out pressure and his drop eight zones. And so far, he's gotten the best of Trevon Boykin. From the TCU 38 yard line, let's see if the Horn Frogs try to get the run game going. They throw it out to Turpin in the flat. The pass was behind him. And Turpin gets pushed out after a short game. Two yard pickup to the 40. You know, you referenced those couple of looks there, Brian. And if you go back over the tape the last few weeks and you look at how Oklahoma State deed up TCU and how Oklahoma deed up Baylor, it was the zone concepts that were the common denominator, the change up, where you think you've got the one on one isolation route, you don't with over the top help, which led to turnovers and really created havoc for TCU and Baylor on offense against that type of defense. Boykin stepping up and he'll run and Boykin drilled from behind lost the ball Baylor has it recovered by Taylor Young another turnover great effort from Jamal Palmer who just rushing the quarterback Dave and then comes up from behind Boykin he's got a motor and he's playing at a high level now Phil Bennett talked about him coming back from an ACL from last year Look at him coming from behind with that effort. Goes right for the football. Clearly out. So that's two turnovers by TCU, both on Boykin. Three giveaways by Baylor. Two on their quarterback. Great play by Palmer to punch it free. Palmer played only five games last year because of a knee injury. And he's made more plays than, than Sean Oakman, who gets more press. And to make a play, an effort play like that when he's he's playing every snap. They don't have any subs to come in for Jabal Palmer. So first down, Johnson's pass caught. The ball on the ground is ruled incomplete. It was intended for Jay Lee. He got whacked. And it's incomplete. Kindred with the stick. Second down. You see these defenses now really keying in, putting a hat on the football, stripping when they get to the ball carrier. This is going to be a key element in how this game ultimately is played out. Who can protect the football best? Heavy rain throughout. This game started 45 minutes late because of lightning. And we've got an official stoppage. Get Switching football, footballs. Yeah. Yep. You know, the other thing, Dave, to keep, a, keep an eye on is these guys have been out here now for an hour and a half almost. And when it's cold like this, the wind chill in the low 20s and you're wet, the hands get really, they get numb. And then the gloves get wet and it makes it even more difficult for all these offensive players to hold on to the football. If you're a quarterback in shotgun. The clock will start in an era. Please set the clock to 446. 446, and the, the clock will start on the snap. Reese, if you're a quarterback in shotgun in these kind of offenses, is it harder when your hands are cold and wet to, to grip it how you want to when you got to catch it quickly and well, throw it quickly? Yeah, there's two issues. The, the first issue is it's wet, so it's slippery. But maybe even more uh, important than that is when it gets cold, now your hand gets numb, so your hand, you can't really feel well, and it's wet. So there's two things going against you. 
Second and ten. Johnson. Everybody covered. And Johnson throws it away. Was he outside the pocket? There was a receiver in the area. Katie Cannon. I think that'll help him here. Third down. It's a good idea by Chris Johnson. Save the yardage. Get outside the pocket and unload that ball. Yards are at a premium. Look at this. Third down tonight. These teams one for 12 and both have been so efficient on third down this year. Baylor is fourth in the country coming in in third down conversions. Well, they've been in third and long a lot. Kendall Bryles, the offensive coordinator. Play clock at one. And Johnson stepping up. It's a jump pass caught by Linwood for a first down to the 35 yard line. Boy, and they almost got caught with an lineman downfield, Blake Muir. This is what some of these defenses dislike about this offense. When that quarterback comes downhill like he's going to run the football and then pops it over the linebacker who's sucking up on the quarterback, you can't have linemen downfield. And Muir was very close. And it is really coming down now. Johnson tried to hit Lee. Incomplete. Denzel Johnson in coverage. And it's second down and 10. This is the hardest it's rained, I think. Luke's would be able to tell us more, but I, I just imagine from what you're watching it, looks like it's the hardest it's come down yet in this game. Second and 10. Johnson keeping at two hands on the football after he turned it over earlier, gets to the 30 yard line. Guys, it's raining so hard right now, they could have a perfectly dry ball when it's snapped and have it be soaking wet by the time it gets to the quarterback. <laughs> uh, th this is really debilitating. And right now, CJ, Chris Johnson seems to be handling it up until this point. Yeah, ball on the ground. Coleman scoops it up, and now they're out of field goal range. And Coleman is hurt. Corey Coleman, their best offensive player, a Bolitnikoff finalist, shaken up on the play as he was taken down by Summers. And then there was another defender who came flying in, Mike Tuaua. Watch this at the end, 93. Hit Coleman right here. Yeah, right on the back of the head there. And that could have easily been called targeting. You got to remember, it's if you hit a defenseless player in the head or neck area with any part of your body, that's a targeting foul. That should have been called on Tua Ua. Only question is, was he pushed by Devin Chafin there? Chafin did give him a little bit of a shove, and I think that's why they didn't throw the flag. Well, Art Browse is hot. He is hot. Corey Coleman's arguably his best player on the team, and when he sees him on the ground and then a defensive lineman comes and hits him in the back of the head, he has every right to be hot. And now a penalty marker is thrown. Delay of game. Offense. Five yard penalty, fourth down. Let's see here if Chafin pushes to a Ua. 28 in white. He shoved him. I don't I, I don't buy that. <laughs> I don't buy that. Tua Ua's uh, 260 pounds. So Galitz to punt again. He's getting more work in this game than he has the entire season. This is four punts already. He averages two punts a game. And look at that thing just die in the mud at the 14. Let's go to Adnan Burke in the studio. All right, thank you very much, Dave. Coming up in the DXL halftime report, the latest on Les Miles. Maria Taylor talks to him. This was just a couple hours ago, but all these rumors swirling around his job there at LSU. Also, Kirk Kerbshire is going to join us. What to look forward to specifically when it comes to Bedlam and Ohio State, Michigan. Also highlights in the Apple Cup and also the Civil War. We're just wondering, how is Tom Luganville holding up in the weather there? Cash back to you. Uh, well, we're doing better than he is, Ed, and I can report. <laughs> He's growing webs on his feet as we speak. <laughs> So TCU takes over at its 15 yard line 241 to go all of its timeouts in a tie ball game. Boykin coming off another turnover a fumble but TCU able to force a punt after Baylor had the ball at midfield. Here's Green and Billings brings him down at the 20 to gain a five. That's one of their better run plays here in the first half. Second straight week with multiple first half turnovers. They were down 17 late in that game to Oklahoma last week. Boykin didn't play because of an injury. They got within one. Gary Patterson decided to go for two in the win instead of playing for overtime. The two point play failed, and TCU suffered a second loss. 
Here's Boykin keeping on second and five, and he's able to slip a tackle and pick up the first down. What an effort, you know, a week ago. You're playing without your best player and Trevon Boykin, and you're on the road, and you turn the football over. Then you have to make another quarterback change from Foster Sawyer to Bram Kohlhausen, and you're still in a position to potentially win that game without 20 starters on your team. I mean, that speaks to the job that Gary Patterson has done this year. Might be his best coaching job. They won 12 games last year, trying to get win number 10 here tonight. Another run play, Green to the outside. And again, a beautiful cutback. I mean, that's hard to do on field turf when it's 80 degrees and sunny, yet you got horrible conditions here, and he's able to make two guys miss with those jump cuts. I think you're going to continue to see Aaron Green run to the outside of the formation because TCU is really struggling to block Andrew Billings on the inside. We'll keep it on the ground here. Green has the first down and goes down to the 42 yard line. And it's a pushing and shoving as uh, Howard made the tackle and then Chance Waz stepped in and started jawing. No penalty flag. Let's see now if TCU starts to turn the pace up now that they're closer to midfield. They've been taking a lot of time here. They're going to call a timeout that will leave them with two. Starting to get a little chippy. We expected coming into this game that this rivalry, bad blood between the two, and Aaron Green, you think he's not ready to play in this football game? So TCU comes into this game, and Brian, knowing that, look, they can't challenge for a Big 12 championship, but they get to 10 wins, play in a big goal, bowl game. And, and Boykin, we knew he'd play, even with the ankle injury. How do you assess his performance, given the conditions? He's had two turnovers, but he had a great touchdown pass in yeah. the first quarter. Well, you're not going to hear me criticize a quarterback when they turn the football over when the conditions are like they are, because I've been there, and this is not easy to play in. These are two explosive offenses, two Trevon Boykin is an outstanding player. I believe he should be in New York for the Heisman Trophy. Uh, but you got to find a way to manage the elements and try not to turn the football over. When, when you're running with the ball, you got to be aware of guys coming from behind you. Uh, the team that protects the ball for the remainder two and a half quarters will win this game. Boykin going to air it out, going for listen B. He can't pull it in. It's incomplete. Oh, that pass was there. Listen, B just couldn't come down with it. Beautiful throw from Trevon Boykin. And normally, Colby Listen, B will come down with this. It would have been a great catch. But we've seen him make these kinds of plays for his quarterback. Xavier Howard in coverage. So 104 to go here in the half. Two timeouts remaining for TCU. Here's Aaron Green. There's no running room. And he is hawk tied inbounds by Oakman. There's Oberchrome. Now he's got a 57 yard made field goal. The conditions were a little different <laughs> when he uh, kicked that one. He's tied for first in Pac 12 history with, uh, or Big 12 history with Michael Honeycutt of Oklahoma for the most career field goals. I think they need to get the football back to Emmanuel Porter. He had two catches early on the opening drive. Why are you taking so much time here, Brian? Not sure. And third and 12. I guess if you don't get it, you're punting to Bailey. You don't want them to have any time. But Boykin off a of pump fake has a wide open guy. And it's dropped. Porter drops the ball. He's wide open. You make that catch and you get out of bounds and stop the clock. And now you have an opportunity to take a couple of shots to get a field goal range. But Nothing is going to be easy when you're handling the football in these elements and you have to almost to a fault focus on the tip of that football. You know teach receivers when the conditions are bad to focus on the tip of the ball. Porter let it go through his hands. Ethan Perry to punt Baylor setting up to go for the block. Now they back off and they got close anyway. And that's a horrible punt goes into the stands. Although to your point nothing is easy I guess we'll, we'll, we'll spare the punter there. Let's see where well, they at least spot he didn't the get ball. It blocked. <laughs> so it's on the Baylor 43 with nine seconds left. They have timeouts. They can take one shot 20 25 yards down the field and give their kicker a chance. Okay. 
Boy, at the start of this game, both offenses go right up and down the field, and you think that it's going to be a, a score fest like it was a year ago, 61-58. to 58. But remember, TCU's only scored seven points on offense that first drive. The other score by Josh Carraway on a scoop and score. Be interesting to see in the second half how these teams adjust. You know, TCU defensively has been outstanding in the last seven games. They've only given up 52 second-half points. It's a testament to the adjustments that Gary Patterson can make at halftime. So I think this is going to be a tight game the whole way through. Both of Baylor's touchdowns came on the ground. When's the last time Baylor had a, a game without a passing touchdown? They throw it to Coleman, who's back on the field. He slips. And will they call a timeout? No. Art Browse lets the clock run out. That's the end of the first half here in Fort Worth. A spot in the college football playoff, perhaps at stake for Baylor and a Big 12 championship if they can win the next two. And Oklahoma loses. We're tied at 14. Time now for the DXL halftime report. The lowest first half scoring for both teams this season. As we're tied at 14, we had a 45-minute lightning delay. It's been raining throughout, and the wind chills in the mid-20s here in Fort Worth as we welcome you back to ESPN College Football Primetime, presented by Jimmy Johns, part of ESPN's rivalry series, presented by Jiffy Lube. Dave Pash, Brian Greasy, Tom Lugan built down on the field, and believe it or not, there's been more turnovers than touchdowns oh, yeah. in this game. When you think about last year's game was 61-58, obviously the weather is playing a huge factor Five giveaways and four touchdown score between well, the two I got teams. Bad news for both teams. I don't think the weather's changing in the second half. It's going to continue to rain. It's going to continue to come down. You know, the, the story in the first half with the turnovers, both quarterbacks through interceptions. You know, this one by Xavier and Howard early in the game for the red zone opportunity. This was just a poor decision by Chris Johnson. I haven't seen him attempt the ball down the field again since that throw which was a bad decision into a two-deep defense. Then this is the play of the game in the first half. Josh Carraway with the scoop and score ties this football game up at 14-all. In the second half, who's going to be able to protect the ball best? I think that's going to go a long way in determining who wins this game. Johnson threw for 58 yards, an interception. He also fumbled the ball away. Trevon Boykin threw for 97 yards and an interception and also fumbled it away. Boykin did throw a touchdown pass in the game. 188 yards of total offense for Baylor, 148 for TCU. And remember, these two teams are first and second nationally. Baylor's on pace to set the FBS record for most yards per game, but under 200 in that first half. So much at stake for Baylor, number seven in the latest college playoff, college football playoff rankings. They need to win tonight, beat Texas next week, and Oklahoma would have to lose tomorrow night against Oklahoma State. Those are all possible if that happens. Baylor would win the Big 12 and get back into the college football playoff discussion. TCU plan for win number 10 and open to spoil its rivals' hopes of glory. TCU will start an offense as we begin the third quarter. And this will be a touchback, and we'll come out to the 25 as we check in with Tom Luganville. Well, the recipe for both of these teams is to try and come up with some way of manufacturing field position and points. In these conditions, with both Art Browse and Gary Patterson, they know the obvious thing is to protect the football. But how can they schematically give their team an advantage if the conditions continue to worsen as they have throughout the course of this game? Temperatures are dropping. So protecting the football, getting field position, and keep in mind the kicking game is going to become critical because in a tie ball game, if a field goal attempt has to be made, it's going to be dicey. And we saw one of those turnovers was a muff punt by Baylor in that first half. Boykin throwing, and couldn't tell that was going to be set up to be a double pass or not. That was thrown behind the line of scrimmage to Kyle Hicks, and Blanchard wraps him up for a one-yard game. You know, just to follow up on what Tom was saying there, I think the second half is going to be more mental than it is schematic because, you know, you go into the locker room, you get a little bit warm, right? You get dry, and then you come back out, and you're now you're right back where you started wet again, and the temperature drops. Which team can be most mentally tough that can embrace the elements and thrive in them rather than allow them to affect you? Boykin running the option here on second and nine. The late pitch as Green steps out at the 27-yard line. So only another yard or two. TCU just can't get the running game going. And 
know, Baylor in the first half in that first quarter had over 100 rushing yards, but TCU did a better job stopping the Bears' rushing attack in the second quarter. Hey, look big, at the third down. There's a big guy in the middle, number 75, that uh, has a lot to say about whether this uh, TCU rush attack gets going. That's Andrew Billings, the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Week, the first time he's won that honor. Oakman drills Boykin, and listen, he drops the ball, but a flag. And Boykin is shaken up. Sean Oakman, who is a specimen at 6'9", 275, walloped. Boykin as he threw that ball. Howard and Waz in coverage of Listenby. Pass interference. Even the rain affecting yeah. the, the microphone yeah. Mike defeat. They get Listenby, the receiver, for offensive pass interference. It's fourth down. Yeah, and Listenby was down there with Xavier Howard. Howard ended up on the ground. I, don't, I didn't see any push there. Obviously, Howard slipped, and that's why he went down. I didn't see a push off. But it was declined, and they're punting anyway. Fourth down. And Hawthorne will let this one roll. And that, that hit a TCU or Baylor player. There was contact down the field, but uh, no penalty flag thrown as boy Patrick Levels came flying down there to block a TCU player. And clearly, Hawthorne was not going to return that ball for the Bears. Perhaps for Oklahoma State and Oklahoma, Bedlam, 8 Eastern on ABC tomorrow night. The Sooners can clinch the Big 12 title with a win. Here we're tied at 14. Baylor's first possession of the third quarter with Chris Johnson. The third string quarterback injuries to Seth Russell and Jarrett Stidham. Johnson making his first start. And he hands it off here to Shock Linwood. And a big run on first down. Gets about seven. Brought down by Traven Howard. Now Shock Linwood needs to get going here in the second half. Take the pressure off of this first time starter, Chris Johnson. Run between the tackles. Well, he marked him down only a five yard gain there. That pass intended for Jordan Fuhrbacher. They're down in their tight ends because Gus Penning's got a shoulder injury. So Fuhrbacher, who is going to redshirt, is playing today. So third down for the quarterback, Chris Johnson. Through only four passes last year and ten this season coming into this one. Now you got to be smart. Chris Johnson is probably not going to come out and win the game in the second half. He's got to manage the game well if he wants to win. Johnson hit. His pass low and incomplete intended for Cannon. Another three and out. It's got to be hard on those shotguns to grip the ball, fake the handoff, and then throw the football and throw a spiral. That thing wobbly, cannon. It's hard for teams like Baylor that Ooh. have been so good. It was close. That have been so good, Dave, offensively, throwing and catching and scoring. They lead the country in total yards on offense and points. It's got to be hard for them mentally not to be able to even complete a simple hitch pass because of the elements. So that's why I said mental, mentally it's going to be big. Fifth punt by Galitz, and Turpin's done a good job of those fair catches. It'll be TCU ball when we come back. Still tied. It's been raining all day, and with the wind chill continuing to drop, we're in the low 20s. Been a huge factor. Both teams with three three and outs, which is a lot for these high scoring teams. Two of the top offenses in all the college football held to two touchdowns apiece. And here's a run play to Aaron Green across the 30 yard line, picks up five, brought down by Blanchard. Each team has punted five times, which is abnormal for these two programs. Yeah, you see Baylor, they don't punt hardly at all. The only team that doesn't punt. Less than them is Navy. But these punters are going to be a factor in this second half because they're going to have to be out there working. And Drew Galitz uh, for Baylor has already dropped one snap. TCU's got a new deep snapper because of injury, but Bryson Burtnett has done a really good job so far. Boykin with a pop pass, and it's pulled in at the 48-yard line. Dominic Merka with just his third catch all season. 
Yeah, Tayon Sells may have intercepted this pass, but he slipped right there, 26. He was going to intercept that and potentially go the other direction for a touchdown. So you see the elements not just only affecting the offense, but defensive players as well when they try to change direction. First down of the 47-yard line, keeping his Boykin, playing with that bad ankle, and down he goes. Chance Waz makes the play at the line of scrimmage. We're so used to seeing Boykin getting outside and making plays, and obviously the, the field, the weather, and the ankle all a factor in no yardage there for Boykin. Yeah, that part of his game is, is not going to be a part of this game. And I think they knew that coming in. Doug Meacham, Sonny Cumbie knew they were going to have to call this game for number two from the pocket. And limits one of the things he does best. Nation's leader in total offense over 400 yards a game. He's barely over 100 today. A screen pass is nearly intercepted. It was tipped and then Avion Edwards had a chance to pick it off. It's third down to 10. Boy, that was a dangerous throw. You call a screen thinking it's a safe play, but that ball thrown out in front of Hicks. Campbell had a chance at it and then as you mentioned Edwards, Javon Boykin's lucky that ball wasn't intercepted. A high pass trying to hit Hicks. So now it's third and ten. TCU just one of eight. They were tenth in the country coming in in third down conversions. You get the ball to Emmanuel Porter. Haven't called his name in quite some time at the top of the screen. And Boykin going to throw it short to Hicks. And Hicks stepped out. Baylor keeps him from getting any yardage, and it'll be a punt, fourth down and long. Well, Brian, I agree with you. Emmanuel Porter's lined up, um, and he's he's one on one with Reed, number nine, on the corner, and the safeties are playing off the hash, but they're walked up. One safety standing right behind the umpire. That one on one downfield throw to Porter, they've got to give him some shots one on one. Well, they've they've made their shots downfield to listen be in the last three attempts, and he's dropped two of them. Give Porter a chance. There was movement by TCU. False start. Offense, number four. Five yard penalty, fourth down. And you talked about it, you know, at some point, a, a special teams mistake. Bryson Burton is the long snapper. He was just, they, they have two different snappers for short uh, field goal attempts and point afters in the long snapper. Matt Boggs is out for the year with injury, but Burtonette continues to do a good job. Gets it back to Perry. And this will bounce inside the 10, and TCU's going to down it inside the 5. Right on cue. Good snap, good punt, good coverage, and Baylor backed up. That's a huge play for TCU. You don't talk about punters affecting the game very often, but Ethan Perry and Burtnett executing to perfection. early in the game the last four punts he hasn't even attempted to catch the ball but now TCU is on to him they're not paying any attention to Hawthorne knowing that Art Bryles and Baylor's strategy is not even to try to field these punts and it backfires backs him up inside the five and Johnson to throw from his end zone and the pass on the sideline is high and incomplete intended for Corey Coleman it's been a quiet night for Coleman only six completions for Johnson that's a big reason why they try to get Coleman involved in the run game. He's actually got more carries than receptions. As you look at Johnson's numbers after a solid start, four for his last 13, including a pick. They blitz off the edge, and Linwood able to keep the feet moving. He was hit by Denzel Johnson at the point of attack, but able to pick up about five yards. Normally you don't talk about field position really mattering for this Baylor offense because they score so fast. But this is a big third down for TCU defensively if they can force a punt from their own end zone. Johnson going to fire it deep, going for Cannon, and he overshot him. So fourth down, and Baylor will have to punt from its own end zone. This has turned into Iowa, Nebraska. <laughs> Punting, running the football, the only way to move the chains. Well, I think, team can complete a pass. Yeah, and I think it's it's going to come down to the small decisions, the small plays, the special teams plays. Art Briles' decision to have Lynx Hawthorne not field any of these punts was a big decision. And Gary Patterson, Ethan Perry, the punter, took advantage of it. Now they're going to get the ball in great position. Well, why not put somebody back there who can 
catch the pump that you trust. Corey Coleman, perhaps. He has returned some punts this year. This is a good kick by Galitz. Excellent job. Fair catch made at the 48 yard line by Turpin. 43 yard punt. Let's look at the college football playoff rankings brought to you by Chick fil A. Baylor moving up from number 10 to number 7 this week. Iowa won today at Nebraska to go to 12 0. Oklahoma's at Oklahoma State tomorrow night. What do you, if all, if any, do you see as an upset perhaps in the top 10 this weekend? Well, I mean, there's a lot of game. Notre Dame and Stanford, I think Stanford has a great shot in that game because of the injuries to Notre Dame, the way that Christian McCaffrey has continued to come on and play his best football down the stretch. That'll be an interesting game. Although I don't know if you'd call that an upset, right, if Stanford wins that game. Here's a pass out of the flat to Nixon. And Baylor doing a good job running of the football. So a gain of about three that time. Chance was on the hit. Well, Michigan, Ohio State, but Ann Arbor. Well, Michigan's favorite. Did you not know that? that, that so you're that, saying that, it would that, be an upset. That would mean that that's not an upset. <laughs> so I couldn't pick that one. You'll be there for that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's, it's going to be the first time I've ever been as a fan. Called it last year. It was a ton of fun. It's going to be. Epic battle between Jim Harbaugh, Urban Meyer. On second and seven, they run Hicks and nowhere to go. Thrilled to the point of attack. And also uh, heavy hearts for uh, anybody involved with the Michigan yeah. program with uh, uh, the death of Lloyd Carr's grandson. Chad, yeah, Chad, Chad Carr yeah. passed away Monday and uh, got to know him a little bit. And his family, Tammy and Jason Carr, wonderful people. And, uh, Tom Curtis. You know, the legendary Michigan player is also Chad's grandfather from Tammy's side. And they're going to have the funeral service on Sunday. Only five years old. Here's third and seven. Boykin waiting, directing, almost falling, getting hit, throws downfield, and it's picked off. No, incomplete. Dropped. Sells couldn't hang on. And Boykin injured. Boy. Start to wonder with Trevon Boykin. You know he's you know he's struggling. He's made these plays his entire career, made guys miss, but at some point you gotta realize that you're not 100 percent and you need to get rid of the football. He's trying to do too much right there and may have aggravated that ankle. His backup. No, it's one of two guys, Bram Kohlhausen and her Foster Sawyer both played last week. This time uh, they have Hawthorne under it and he is yep. able to pull it in. Well, after we're done here stick around for Sports Center at night with Steve Levy and John Bouchagross. They'll have complete coverage of all the action in the NBA. The Warriors going for a 17 0 start. Also a look ahead to uh, the weekend of college football. A lot of college basketball going on today. Well, it's interesting that Art Bryles got in links. Hawthorne said this man we got to catch the ball. You got to catch it. And that might be one of the uh, most important plays as this game goes on is the battle between the two punt returners, Lynx Hawthorne and Cavante Turpin, who can catch the ball. Five turnovers so far in the ball game. Special teams have been an adventure. It's been raining throughout. Midway through the third, we're still tied at 14. It was 14-7 halfway through the first quarter. Johnson's pass is pulled in. A flag comes down. Coleman wrapped up at the 19 yard line a six yard gain if it stands. Only seven points have been scored since the midway point of the first. Offense number 61. It's a five yard penalty. First down. It's the right guard Broxton who is more than three yards downfield. Uh, and this happens with Baylor because they'll call a run play. And then they'll throw it off of it. So you see Broxton goes downfield, but the decision by Johnson to throw the football, and that's what defensive coordinators have been, you know, upset about in this offense is you call a run play and a pass play on the same play, and those linemen get downfield and you're still throwing the football. Sometimes it's borderline with Baylor, whether it's three yards or three and a half yards. He was actually further downfield than Corey Coleman who caught the ball. Linwood straight ahead past the 10 and out to the 13 yard line to get a chunk of it back. Chris Bradley on the stop. Shock Linwood playing through injury. Hurt his ankle in the win at Oklahoma State. He comes in leading the Big 12 in rushing at 124 yards a game. They'll give it to him again on second down. And he gets hammered. 
Man, Ty Summers been all over the field for TCU. He's got 10 tackles in the game, bringing up a third down. Gary Patterson has figured out that he needs to bring pressure on Chris Johnson in the second half. He's not concerned about him throwing the ball down the field. He's going to put as much pressure on a young quarterback as he possibly can. And in the meantime, he'll stop the running game. On third and long, Johnson taking off. Great play by Summers again. Only a couple of yards for Johnson, and Baylor will have to punt it again. Well, they're asking Johnny jo Jefferson, the running back, to try to block the middle linebacker. You can see Jefferson's going to come up and try to get the block on Summers, but Summers just beats him to the punch, and he's made four or five plays in this game. 240 pound quarterback Summer says no problem. Baylor to punt again four words that we're not used to saying but that has been truth in this game that snap a little to the left of Galitz and this is going to work out extremely well for Baylor Turpin saying that's on me pointing to himself as he runs to the CCU sideline a 56 yard punt. Well Javon Boykin was on the sideline guys just kind of hopping and jogging trying to stay loose you can tell he's severely hampered and and he looked stiff in pregame warm-up Brian we talked about that when we came on air but that last series took its toll on Boykin he's got to get rid of the football get it out of his hand hopefully Doug Meacham here on the sideline right next to me will do some things in the passing game to allow him to get into a rhythm and not rely on having to work so far downfield in the passing game which also leads to him having to create and move around unnecessarily only completing 50% of his passes in the game. First down at the 27 yard line. Here's Aaron Green. And there's no running room at all against this Baylor defense. No gain on the play. Taylor Young was in the area of Green. There's Meacham, co offensive coordinator. It's, uh, it's tough on these coordinators in games like this. You want to call something, you see. You know the scheme or the strategy or the opportunity to throw the ball down the field or to run a reverse or things like that and you just can't do it because you're concerned every time the ball is snapped about turnover. Green again this time finds a running lane it closes quickly though. Tayon sells making the stick at the 33 but that's a good pickup six yards third and manageable. At least now, if you're Beecham and, and Cumbie, you've got some options here because you're not third long. You've been third long most of the night, and that's why they've been terrible in terms of converting third downs. The problem is that the zone read that they love to run with Trevon Boykin doesn't have the sting because Baylor knows that Boykin is not going to keep the football. They're one of ten. Baylor's one of eleven on third down, and Green won't pick it up. Brought down by Sells, short of the first down. It's fourth and two, and TCU will kick the ball back to Baylor. Eventually, you're going to have to throw the ball down the field, and I know that uh, you know, the, the high, there's not a high likelihood of completing a bunch of these balls down the field, but but you got to try because you just can't keep running the ball into the middle and and three and out every single series. Think about it. The last offensive score came midway through the first quarter. TCU tied the game on a defensive score in the second quarter. Harry's punt will roll inside the 30 yard line and stop around the 23 of Baylor. Scoring recap. Well, this will be a quick uh, highlight package. Rushing touchdown for Devin Chafin. Boykin comes back, throws a touchdown pass. This was in the first quarter. Tied the game at seven. Chafin makes it 14-7 Baylor. That was a score at the end of one. But then Johnson fumbles. Caraway returns it for a touchdown to tie it up. So a little different than last year's 61 58 epic that Baylor won in Waco. But it looks like we're going to have a close game down the stretch again here in 2015. Chris Johnson, the quarterback, first down from the Baylor 23. He's only completed six passes in this game, thrown just 17. They're going to keep it on the ground. 
Devin Chafin, who has the two touchdowns, out to the 28 for a handful brought down by Traven Howard. If they're going to run the ball with any kind of success, they need to get this offensive line to the linebacker level, to the second level, and get a hat on Summers. Chafin again trying to pick a hole. What a great play made that time by true freshman Joseph Broadnax. He was on the ground, just reached his hand up and made the tackle. Trip up the running back Chafin. Yeah, he's there in the middle. Splits the double team and then just kind of emerges. He's playing because Aaron Curry is injured. Third and four. Chafin gets the first down. Able to power through an arm tackle of Summers to move the sticks. And I, and I don't understand the strategy by, by Baylor. Nobody's blocking number 42 for TCU. He's had free shot after free shot on Johnson, that time on Chafin. we got to get alignment to the second level. Ruling on the field is a first down. The previous play is under further review. They're going to look to make sure that Chafin had the line to gain. 350 on the clock here in the third quarter, tied at 14 apiece. Got to get to the 33. I think that's pretty clear. And the right knee is down, but it, from that angle, hard to tell where the ball is. But it seemed like he was pretty well past the first down marker when he went to the ground. So what's it going to take in a game like this, Brian? to get the winning score. Neither team can move the ball right now. It's all about punting and whether a team makes a mistake or not. After further review, the ruling on the field stand. It might not be a big play on offense that wins the game, right? I mean, it's it's tough out here. These elements, this is as tough as it gets. And I've played in a lot of different environments and weather. And uh, when it's like this, it, it's there's no tougher environment to play a football game in than when it's raining hard and the wind chill is in the low 20s. I mean, it's just, this is as hard as it gets. To feel like that 5 nothing win against Purdue you had back in 95? <laughs> yes. You were great that day, by the way. So all five points. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> First down in the 34, Chafin, and Summers wraps him up, but that's a six-yard run. You no, know, we've talked about how the kicking game can get affected, and Dave, you asked, you know, what's it going to take? Well, with all these high volume of punts, at some point or another, the riskiness of that ball getting on the ground off of a punt could change this game, certainly in field position. Well, they're keeping it on the ground, Tom, and Chapin gets the first down. And they have more punts in this game than completions. I don't, I'll bet that's never happened in the history of Art Bryles <laughs> coaching football at any level, going back to Stephenville High School. A combined 15 punts. Now this is going to be a pass for Johnson. Going to throw it deep. Incomplete. Almost intercepted by Derek Kindred. The intended receiver was Chris Platt. These are the passes that Chris Johnson completed last week. The problem is that it's taking so long for the ball to get down there that the safety Kindred has plenty of time to get over there and make a play. The receiver was open, beat the corner. The problem is the safety has way too much time and Chris Johnson telegraphed the throw. If this is Stidham or Russell, is it any different? No, I mean, it might be a little bit different, but it's tough for everybody. Ball start. Ball start. Offense, number 69, five-yard penalty, second down. Now, now you start to press if you're an offensive lineman, right? Ben yeah. Colbert? With that being said, probably the easiest throw to make in these kind of conditions is that ball down the field because you don't have to be as accurate. If it's short, it gets caught up in the rain or the wind, at least your receiver can fight back to the, to the football. There's Laquan McGowan running into your screen at 410 pounds. See if they try to hammer it off that right side with Chafin. McGowan has caught two passes this year. I don't know if they're going to give the big guy a touch, though, in these conditions. <laughs> Johnson going to throw it deep again. Incomplete through the hands of Katie Cannon. Again, hard to track for the receiver. There was contact with Julius Lewis down there. So it's third down and 15. I, you know, but I like the approach. I mean, throw it down there. Let Cannon see it. It's short, as we talked about. Let him come back and try to make a play. And 
you know, these are some of the best wide receivers in college football between Coleman, Lee, Cannon. They're your best players. They got to make a play for you. But Brian, I don't understand why they just didn't keep running the ball. And at this point, I mean, you're getting six, seven yards a pop well, on first down. Though I'm saying the last two plays were, were deep shots. TCU's been outstanding against the run in this game. Johnson with time through the hands of Chafe, and that was hot and high, incomplete fourth down. This is clearly, I don't know if you guys can see it from where you're at, the hardest we have had this downpour throughout the game. It's also the windiest down here. Brian, you referenced that ball taking so long to get downfield, and he's also throwing into a pretty decent wind, and it's swirling down here. Uh, these coaches, I'm on the TCU sideline right now, and Doug Meacham, who's normally very reserved as the offensive coordinator, very frustrated right now because there's nothing he can do. He feels like he can't help his football team offensively, and the, certainly the Baylor coaches feel the same way. The better punter might win the game. Don't think that uh, didn't think that would be an issue coming into tonight. Great job there by Galitz, pinning TCU inside the 10. It's a 52-yard boot. Well, these players aren't the toughest uh, individuals tonight. These are these are the tough ones here. I mean, you can talk about. Cold now. You get wet and cold. They're still dancing. You know, Tom asked earlier. I don't know if we can see it. I don't even know that Tom can see it from down there. It's raining so hard right in front of your face. And I think that's got to be hard for those receivers on the deep balls, just trying to chat, attract the football. So now Travon Boykin standing on his goal line in a puddle. First down at the TCU six-yard line. Green. Has a hole at the 10. One of the best runs of the night. Howard on the stop. But it's a 14 yard pickup for Aaron Green. TCU at 9 and 2, trying to get its 10th 10 win season in 15 years for Gary Patterson as they put Sean Nixon in. As the Wildcat quarterback, he'll keep it and dragged down by Grant Campbell after a gain of three as TCU just tries to change it up there. Yeah, I like it. I like it. It's, they're going to do it again. Teron Boykin is in the is in the bunch down here, bunch set, and Nixon. Is this because Boykin's this is having because, trouble yeah, this running? This is because he can't bring that element uh, from the quarterback position to run the ball, so you get Wildcat, and at least you get the numbers right. Nixon will keep it. And he gets squashed by Blanchard and Palmer for no gain. Yeah, that's exactly the change up, Brian, because right now Baylor doesn't have the bodies in the box to account for the quarterback as a runner. So it gives you extra half a man. Now we've got Boykin coming back in here. The other thing, too, rarely are you going to see in these conditions the quarterback or the Wildcat actually pull the ball because mesh points are very, very difficult in wet conditions. And Boykin's in there, Tom, for... A passing situation here in third and six. They're one of 11 on third down in this game. 0 for 4 this half. And Boykin throwing a jump ball. And it's almost intercepted. Xavier Howard had picked one off earlier. Went up for it. Colby Listenby, the receiver, was basically playing the role of a defender there. Fourth down. Now this is the fourth or fifth time we've seen this throw down the sideline to Colby Listenby. I'm surprised that Sonny Cumby coaches the quarterbacks, hasn't come up with a strategy to get somebody down the middle of the field. They've thrown so many balls to the outside, and the safeties are going that direction. They went up the middle, it'd be open. That punt may have been blocked. We said the better punter might win the game. And Ethan Perry it was hard to tell if that one got blocked Terrence, or if it was just a bad kick. I think Terrence Williams blocked it. Number 22 came right up the middle. The backup running back gets a hand on. Yeah, it looked like uh, maybe a finger. So that will give Baylor the ball at the 35-yard line. Great job by Williams. Yeah, he definitely you know, he got it. He doesn't get a whole lot of looks at the running back position, but on. Special teams, it's going to be the special teams are going to win this game for somebody. That was a great play going away from it that time. And he's still got a hand on it. So now Baylor with an opportunity, a minute to go in the third. Still tied at 14. Ball on the 35-yard line. Shock Linwood. He gets shocked. Big hit at the point of attack. 
by Ty Summers again. Traven Howard actually on the tackle. Yeah, I mean, Traven Howard at 190 pounds, converted safety. Take a look at that. He has stepped up for TCU and Gary Patterson on defense and been a physical presence at Mike Linebacker. He doesn't look like a linebacker. looks like a safety physical hit. Off play action. Johnson looking deep. Going to take a shot into the end zone. Over through Katie Cannon. Cannon arguing that Derek Kindred interfered with him or held him, and that's why Cannon couldn't release. You it's know, third I, down and ten. I think the one thing that Chris Johnson, the adjustment he can make is is not throw the perfect pass, but just give your receivers a chance. If that ball is thrown short, at least give Cannon a chance to fight back to the football, maybe make a play or get a PI call. Third and ten. Baylor two of thirteen. They're going to run Chafin on third and long, and he's got the first down. Great job to pick up the first down, get a few extra yards to the 20-yard line. Yeah, and this is a great adjustment from Kendall Browse. The first counter that we've seen. We've seen all inside run. This time you run counter, and I love it because it forces the defense to react. And when they go to plant and switch directions, they're losing their footing. That's why he got the first down. Johnson keeping, and he gets swallowed by Davion Pearson in the backfield. A loss of four on the play. Pearson, who missed the first three games of the season with injury. He's been outstanding since coming back, the senior from Oklahoma City. Got a handful of tackles, including that one for a loss, as we played three quarters here in Fort Worth. We're still tied at 14. Neither team has scored on offense since the midway point of the first quarter. We go to the fourth, all even. Slash Taco Bell to learn how to win a chance to join your school student section at the college football playoff. And this uh, student section has been fantastic, even when their only mistake was when they were told to leave the field because of the lightning and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> First time Baylor has had back-to-back -back scoreless quarters this season. But they're inside the 25 for second down. Chapin running left. Gets to about the 19. Bringing up third down at 8 or 9. They pass Brian Greasy, Tom Logan, Bill in Fort Worth. Temperature in the high 30s. Wind chill in the low 20s. It's been raining all day and night. We had a 45-minute lightning delay. Back-to-back -back scoreless quarters for Baylor. A combined 100 and 12 yards for both these teams in the third. Both the Baylor's touchdowns came on the ground. Last time they did not have a passing touchdown in the game was three years ago. TCU had an offensive touchdown, a pass by Boykin, and a defensive touchdown to tie the game in the second quarter. Johnson lost the ball! Recovered by Baylor, or no, recovered by TCU! Davion Pearson comes up with the fumble for TCU. And another big play by Carraway. He had a scoop and score in the first half. This time he goes up. Look at the great control to come back down and get a hand on the football. And Davion Pearson's there to thwart that Baylor drive. Carraway coming off a two and a half sack effort at Oklahoma. Had two great weeks for the Horn Frogs. When Baylor's in position to potentially attempt a field goal, which would be huge with the conditions as they are currently, and you wonder the decision on third and ten to attempt to throw the ball down the field comes back to bite Art Bryles. First start for Johnson came on in relief of the injured Stidham last week at Oklahoma. Now Boykin to throw on first down. Listen, be able to pull it in. A gain of about six. Xavier Howard in coverage. Trevon Boykin playing through an ankle injury. The FBS leader in total offense has struggled today. Turned it over a couple times. But they're going to put the ball in his hands and try to win the game, his final home game. Boykin gets across the 30. He'll come up just short of the first down. But man, when's the last time we've had a third and one or two for either team in this game? It's mo mostly third and six plus. Oh, you got to give Trevon Boykin credit. And you see that 
his legacy is cemented here at TCU as one of the all time greats to ever play for the Horned Frogs and uh, this final quarter in a rivalry game no matter how ugly it's been if you would have told Trevon Boykin at the start of this game he'd have a tie ball game with a chance to win it in the fourth quarter in his last game in Eamon Carter he would have taken that any day. They got Sean Nixon at quarterback here as Boykin motions out and penalty marker down. They did not get the playoff in time. So they try to get cute there by motioning Boykin and having Nixon take the direct snap and it costs him. Well, that's what Doug Meacham, you know, when you put a, a wide receiver at quarterback, he's not looking at the play clock. I can guarantee you that. So third and seven and Boykin back in at quarterback. Boykin a finalist for the Davey O'Brien Award. O'Brien a former TCU great. Goes to the top quarterback in college football. Third and seven. Can Boykin make a play? And that pass high and incomplete. Try to hit listen B. It was short of the sticks anyway. Fourth down. Another punt. This is the exact opposite of the game last year where it was all passing touchdowns. This game's all about punting. I mean, look at that. It's going to be the 10th punt for TCU. Baylor's got eight punts after having 29 through the first 10 games. The last punt by TCU was blocked by Terrence Williams. Uh, will Lynx Hawthorne decide to field this punt or let it drop? And Hawthorne will field it. Signaled for the fair catch. He muffed one and turned it over in the first half. 38 yard punt, no return. And again, no offensive points for either team since the midway point of the first quarter. Baylor six completions, TCU 12 completions. And Chris Johnson 0 for 8 passing this half. 6 for 21 on the night, making his first collegiate start. He's the third string quarterback, former receiver. They run Chafin, and he gets about four yards. Uh, Corey Coleman only has one catch in the game. He's their best player. They got to get him to football. And I think the biggest adjustment for Chris Johnson needs to be when he's throwing that deep ball, just don't overthrow your receiver. Give him a chance to come up and make a catch. Great play in the open field by Orr to take down Chafin. If Chafin beat Orr, he probably would have got the first down. Instead, brings up a third down. And you might think about getting Corey Coleman involved in the offense running the football. Reverse. Something of that nature. You got to get number one with the ball in his hands. He's at the bottom of your screen, matched up against O'Mealy. Here's Chapman straight ahead, and they're going to mark him short at the 46 yard line. Now, in the first half, they went for it twice on the opening drive on fourth down. Do you do, you do that here, or do you kick it? I think he's going to go for it. If he did it for the first drive, he's going to, why not do it now? Here's Chapman, and he's got it to midfield. I think Kendall Bryles, the offensive coordinator there, found last drive. They got down into the red zone and they turned the football over, but they found something working in the running game with Chafin and with Je Jefferson. And I think he likes his chances to seize momentum in this football game here on this offensive possession. Fresh set of downs at midfield. And a downpour. Jefferson between the tackles gets another four or five. Wrestle to the ground. By Bradley and Pearson. Now Baylor is in TCU territory again. They turned it over the last time. They actually got into the red zone before Chris Johnson fumbled it away for the second time. He's also thrown two picks in the game. Here's Jefferson, and he gets nothing. Drop for a loss. Pearson and Caraway both back there for the Horn Frogs. It's third down. Well, and third down has been where this TCU defense has really excelled not only in this game but all season long they are sixth in the country on third down defense giving up only 28 percent conversion. Johnson gets hit and overthrows the intended target incomplete. He was trying to hit Fuhrbacher. It's fourth down and Baylor will punt. Terrell Lathan gets the hit. And he goes right around Spencer Drango, number 58, one of the best set of tackles in all of college football. 
And that affected the throw by Johnson. It's been Caraway. It's been Brodnax, Davion Pearson. You got to give credit to this defensive line for TCU. They have affected this game in a multitude of ways. Much easier for the defense, right, when you have this bad footing and weather? Well, not necessarily. It's not easy to rush the passer when you can't get your own footing. Galitz catches it, gets rid of it. And that's a great bounce inside the 10. Galitz, the MVP for Baylor. <laughs> State tomorrow night on ABC, then the Sooners win the Big 12. But if they lose, it opens the door for both Oklahoma State and Baylor. For the Bears, they have to win tonight, beat Texas and Waco next week, and then, as mentioned, hope that Oklahoma loses tomorrow night. And Baylor still in the conversation for the college football playoff if they can win this game. Tied with TCU at 14, 10 minutes to go in the fourth quarter, and the Horn Frogs are backed up again. First down from their seven yard line. Boykin to throw from his goal line and in the traffic it's caught by Porter for a gain of about five. Now Doug meets him down here on the field with Sonny Cumbie upstairs. Doug meets him very frustrated. Now this is a guy that's got a very even keel personality. Doesn't get caught up in the ebbs and flows but he's kneeling down. Got his hands on his head. Very frustrated with the ineffectiveness and I, he knows the conditions are are what they are still expects better perfection better execution out of his offense now this is a nightmare for play calling and this doesn't matter what you dial up as you see there I mean green makes a move and then he just slips yeah. because of the turf and picks up maybe a yard or two another third down here you know the one the one guy that that has at least been consistent catching the football has been Emmanuel Porter and you just saw he caught one, another one on the last uh, play get him the football he's got He's proven that he can catch the ball in this condition. Yeah, no Josh Dotson. He's out for the season. He's the number one receiver in the country in terms of yards per yards per game. No Porter has stepped up in his absence. Here's third and three. Boykin out of the backfield. The pass was behind Hicks. Incomplete. Another punt coming for TCU with 9:03 to go. I think that uh, I think Hicks turned the wrong way here. Teron Boykin was expecting him to look over his upfield shoulder and he turned the other way see he looked like he was going upfield and Trevon Boykin expected him to go yeah you see yeah go towards the sticks and so I'm throwing the football miscommunication they had him open for a first down Ethan Perry to punt Bryson Burtnett is the long snapper and there was movement by TC which means they're going to punt from their end zone ball start offense number 17 five yard penalty Fourth down. Keep in mind too that uh, you know Burton at the long snapper, the first time doing it. He was the short snapper. Now he's going to handle both duties with Matt Boggs out for the year. We've talked about the long snappers tonight more than I think in any game this year. <laughs> but in these conditions, with your coming great. backed up, he's been great. That one on the money to Perry, and this is a liner. Takes a TCU bounce, but then the ground slows it down. It'll be Baylor ball on its side of the 50 yard line after a 41 yard punt. Still tied at 14. Worry behind. It has been pouring down rain all day and night here in the Dallas Fort Worth area. No offensive touchdown since the midway point of the first quarter. Johnson going to look for one here, airing it out into traffic, broken up, incomplete. Intended for Cannon, Julius Lewis in coverage for TCU. How about that decision? Well, he had KD Cannon breaking open downfield. It's just he couldn't get anything on that ball. It slipped out of his hands. Comes up way short. Cannon holding his uh, right hand. <laughs> but Brian, how about they're running just the ball cold. so well, though? How about just keep pounding it? Well, they're running the ball so well, they've got zero points out of it. You know, you figure that you throw the ball down the field and give some of your best players a chance. Seems like they get away from it, though. Good job again by Summers. Drilling Chafin, a gain of maybe two yards. It'll be third and long here for Baylor. First two drives look easy for the Bears. 
but over their last 14 drives, only 128 yards and obviously no points. A big reason why they don't just run the football, Dave, is when you run the football like that, it's going to take you eight or ten plays to get down the field. And right now they can't do that consistently enough without mistakes or turning the football over to get it in the end zone. So that's why they're throwing the ball down the field, trying to get a big play. Chris Johnson making his first start at quarterback. Injuries to Seth Russell and Jarrett Stidham. Johnson is 6 of 23 passing for 58 yards. Run play on third and long and Pearson slams chafing down to the 45. Fourth and five and Baylor's going to punt it away. The only good thing for these offensive coordinators is if you do go three and out you know the likelihood is the other team's going to go three and out you're going to get it right back. Play field position I mean. How many times Baylor fourth and five at the opponent's 45 it's a gimme they're going for but not in these conditions. Galitz to punt. Look how spread out Baylor is in their formation here. Snapping the ball at Galitz. Turpin under it makes the fair catch. At the 10 yard line. Sound like a broken record, but we're still tied at 14. College football presented by K Jewelers at noon Eastern on ABC. Tomorrow it's Ohio State and Michigan from the Big House. Then at 3.30 on ESPN, can Penn State upset Michigan State? If that were to happen, the Michigan Ohio State winner would move on to the Big Ten Championship game to play Iowa. The Hawkeyes number four in the college football playoff remain undefeated by winning in Lincoln against Nebraska today. First down for TCU on its 10. They're going to run Hicks off the left side. Makes a man miss at the 15. Hicks still going and finally steps out just past the 25 yard line. That's biggest run of the night for TCU and Hicks. Gets a little bit of a seam. Nice kick out block. Good job by Emmanuel Porter, the wide receiver blocking Blanchard. Hicks running right this time. Past the 30 and then shoved to the ground by Billings at the 33. That last play was almost 20 yards, not quite. Look tonight, 20 plus yard play is a total of three. TCU at 76 and Baylor 65 coming in. Pitch to Hicks on second and four. Cuts it back. Has the first down. Oakman trying to rip the ball out. Hicks down to the 39-yard line. We've seen a, a couple of different change-ups from Doug Meacham. We saw Wildcat a couple drives ago. This drive, the pace seems a little bit quicker. And clearly, they're trying to get the ball with their backs on the perimeter. They're done trying to block big number 75 Billings inside. And they're trying to attack the perimeter of this Baylor defense. Nearing six minutes to go in the fourth. Here's Aaron Green trying to find a hole. It's not there. Dropped by Edwards and Palmer after a pickup of a couple. The last score came in the second quarter. A defensive touchdown. A fumble recovery by Josh Carraway. Penalty marker down. Here's Green out to the 48-yard line for six yards. See what the flag is about. TCU's won 12 straight at home. That's the third longest active streak in the Power Five. Andrew Billings are hurt for Baylor on the play. A formation foul on TCU, five yards, but uh, Billings hobbling for Baylor. He's their best defensive player. And you saw his sub came in and he said no nah, man I'm good he's that's a warrior right there 75 one of the strongest players in all of college football and he came up a little bit gimpy but I don't think there's any chance of that man coming out of this game three year starter first team all big 12 last year so the penalty by TCU puts him in second and 12. And Boykin to throw has time and lobs it downfield. It's nearly intercepted off the fingertips of Teon Sells. Dominic Merka, the tight end, was the intended receiver. Third down and 12. 
And I think that not only the elements affect Boykin, but also his ankle. Look at his feet. He's just not able to step into any of these throws, Dave. And that one kind of floated out of his hands. I don't think it was that the ball was wet. I just think he's really struggling to transfer that weight on that right ankle. Was hurt against Kansas, did not play last week in their loss at Oklahoma. So it's third down and 12. Devontae Turpin running out of the field late there for the Horn Frogs. The play clock is at two. Three man rush. Boykin stepping up and running. Boykin to the outside, gets a block, and has to step out well short of the first down. Fourth down at about four. TCU will punt it away. Nearing five minutes to go. Remember last year, it was 61 58 in Waco. And the way this game started here at Amon G. Carter Stadium, 14 7, seven minutes in with Baylor on top. We thought we might be headed that way again. No offensive touchdowns since as Baylor looks to keep its hopes alive of a Big 12 title and a college football playoff spot. As the fumble ball was fumbled and then Oakman almost took down the punter Perry back at the 30 yard line did a good job to get rid of the punt before he was drilled by Oakman. Dave that ball went right through Ethan Perry's hands. It was a good snap. It just went between his hands take a look it's an eight yard punt we've talked about it all game and Perry's the first punter to that's live because the ball hit the yeah. ground yeah it's a good point the ball hits the ground so there is no roughing the, uh, the punter in he that did a situation. good job to get rid of that thing had one blocked earlier we saw Galitz of Baylor drop a snap as well. So Baylor ball near midfield 15 consecutive drives without points for the Bears. That's the long, longest single game streak under Art Riles in his eight years at Baylor. And now Chris Johnson sophomore from Bryan Texas another opportunity to try to get the Bears the lead back. In the final five minutes of regulation and the balls on the ground a fumble and TCU has it Chafin puts it on the ground Derek Kindred with the recovery I don't know if Chafin was anticipating getting that football from Johnson Let's take a look does Johnson get the ball all the way in the belly it's the responsibility of the quarterback to get it in there it's hard to tell. It's tough. And the decision, remember, Tom talked about the decision to, to not play with dry footballs, that they wanted to maintain the pace. Both these teams did, and we've seen them struggle with the football. Here's Hicks off the right edge. Across midfield into Baylor territory out of bounds just short of the first down marker. So a gain of close to nine for Hicks. That's the fifth turnover by Baylor. Johnson and Chafin couldn't get the exchange. Hard to tell but it did look on the replay like Chafin did not fully have it. Here's Hicks or make that Boykin off the fake trying to get the first down. And he stepped out after he got the first to the 44 yard line. This was moments ago. And Chapin saying that that's on you, the quarterback, Chris Johnson. Yeah, well, it's on both of them. It's not on one guy. They have to make each other right. And, you know, again, we've said it 10 times in this game. It's the little things that you have to focus on and overemphasize. And ball handling in these elements is, is one of them. From the 44 of Baylor, another run. Here's Hicks. No running room. Upended at the 45, a loss on the play. Pat Levels. Check that Tayon sells with the hit. And well, so it'll be second down and 11. If you're Phil Bennett now, a defensive coordinator for Baylor, you don't have any concern about Trevon Boykin throwing the ball down the field. They, they stopped attempting to throw the ball down the field. Listen, B has been absent. Porter hasn't been targeted down the field, so he's just he's just attacking this run game with seven, eight, nine guys at times in the box. Approaching three and a half minutes to go in regulation. 
Hicks trying to find a hole. Stood up at the 44 yard line. Taylor Young in there for the Bears. It brings up third and long. Neither team has attempted a field goal. Should either squad be put in that situation, whether in regulation or in overtime? Yeah, well, it, it will happen in overtime. The better kicker is TCU's Jaden Overcrom. He is uh, the career leader in Big 12 history and made field goals, tied for first with Oklahoma's Michael Honeycutt. Yeah, well, how, how do those guys feel? They haven't attempted one kick all game. You think they're nice and warm and toasty over there on the sideline? Here's third and long. Boykin in trouble. They're trying to set the screen up. Hicks with the catch and a great play at the 45 by Edwards. In the open field, Avion Edwards takes down Hicks. It's fourth down and 10. And TCU is going to try to pin Baylor deep. Now remember, the last snap to Ethan Perry, he put on the ground. But Baylor gave it right back with a fumble. And you wonder, depending on where Baylor gets the ball, do they play for overtime at this point? Because they don't want to make a mistake deep in their own end. Perry's punt will bounce at the 10. And it's about the ball, not the feet. And I think they kept it from going into the end zone. They did. Nico Small was down there. And again, in college football, it's all about where the ball is. And it was out of the end zone. It didn't matter where Small was when he touched it. Oh, great play by Nico Small. True freshman safety. Loses his footing, but is aware enough to keep that football out of the end zone. That's the, the, the little plays, right, on special teams that are going to have the outcome in this game. Nico Small just made one. It'll be Baylor ball from the one when we come back. Just outside, two minutes to go here in the fourth quarter. Tied at 14. We're tied at 14 with 2.10 on the clock. Baylor with the ball at its one yard line. And remember, a safety probably wins the game for TCU. It's interesting with Tris Johnson making his first collegiate start and all the problems handling the football, he's lined up a shotgun. They hand it off and out of the end zone is Chafe and he gets to about the four. Well, you talk about a safety day, but let's just say Baylor isn't able to get out from their own area here and is forced to punt. If you're TCU, you bring all 11 and say, if we rough them, we rough them. I mean, this is an opportunity right here just because of field position to sell out. That's a good point, Lugs. And, and if they're able to stop them on second and third down, they're going to think about calling a timeout to make sure that they have to attempt that punt. Snap to Johnson. He'll hand it off. Chafin out to about the eight-yard line. So third down coming up, third in about three, and TCU will call a timeout. That will leave the Horned Frogs with two. I like that timeout there because Gary Patterson knows even if, so they don't get a first down, at least they now have an opportunity, even if they don't block the punt, that they could get in field goal range to attempt a game-winning yeah. field goal. And again, they've got the, the better of the two kickers. It was Chris Callahan for Baylor that won the game 61-58 last year. That was a short field goal over Chrome. One of the best kickers in, in the history of the Big 12. He's got a, a very strong leg, would be able to handle these conditions, but every snap has been an adventure in, in this game. It has. I mean, it's been uh, these two teams. We don't expect this kind of game from these two teams, but it's actually been really interesting to watch this game and how these coordinators have tried to adjust some of the things Doug Meacham has, has tried to, to employ. The, the patience of Kendall and Art Bryles, knowing that their offense has been so explosive all year, this was never going to be a Picasso, right? But now it's about who has a little bit left in the tank and that refusal to lose this football game is going to make a play, and it might be in overtime, but which team is going to make that play to win the game? Any chance Art Bryles lets Chris Johnson throw the ball here on third and three? No. So is it a handoff? Is it a quarterback run with their 230-pound cue here? He's yep. fumbled the ball a couple times, though. He'll hand it off to Chafin, keeps the feet moving, holds on to the ball, and gets the first down. Wow. And that was big. It's not big because Baylor's going to go down the field on this drive and score. They're, they still have a lot of field to go, but that's big just getting out of the shadow of your own goalpost and not having to attempt that punt out of your end zone. 
Chafin shakes a couple of tacklers and gets to the 20 yard line. Clearly Baylor playing for overtime at this point. We're inside a minute remaining here in the fourth quarter. Again, neither team has scored since the first half and neither team has scored on offense since the midway point of the first quarter. The last score was a Josh Carraway fumble recovery return 50 yards for a TD for TCU. These two teams are having too much fun out here to go, you know, with just 60 minutes. They want some extra time. We thought we might have overtime, but thought the score might be in the mid-50s when we got there here tonight. Chafin off the right side, crosses the 30, and dumped at the 34-yard line by Nick Orr. Clock stop as they reset the chains. Now that you have better field position, Baylor's going to call a timeout. Do you take a couple of shots down the field here? Why not? You know, some of those plays that were too risky to attempt, you know, when the game was still in the balance, maybe you attempt a reverse or something. Maybe get, get the ball in Corey Coleman's hands on a reverse or something like that and let him try to weave his way through, maybe make a play. What about a jump ball down the field, or yep. is that too risky there? I mean, you assume even if you throw a pick down here, TCU hasn't been able to move the ball at all, so yeah. does it really hurt you? No, I think it's a smart play, you know, by Art Bryles. Call this time out. You never know. With the field the way it is and defenders having to change direction, you get the ball in a really explosive player's hands like Coleman or, or Lee, Cannon, and, and they can make guys miss and maybe score. I kind of like the idea of taking a shot, throw it up for grabs. If it gets picked off, TCU's got the ball at its 30-yard line with 12 seconds left. If Baylor catches it, now you're in a position maybe to win the game with a field goal. Tight set here. That's Corey Coleman in the backfield. They're going to pitch it to Coleman, and he's taken down by Denzel Johnson for a loss. Let's see if TCU calls a timeout. Yep, 16 seconds left. <laughs> Gary Patterson says, okay, if you're going to do that, I'm going to call my timeouts, and I'm going to make you punt now that you're backed up second and 16. Well, you only got one more timeout. I don't think we'll get to a punt. I think he's just hoping that there'll be a botched snap and yeah. another fumble. Baylor's turned it over five times in this game. We've seen a muffed punt, an interception. The quarterback, Johnson, has dropped the ball. There was a fumbled exchange between Johnson and Chafe and the running back earlier in the quarter. 16 seconds remaining in regulation. One more timeout for TCU. So probably two more plays offensively for Baylor. Well, they, they did what you said, Grease. They, they gave the ball to Corey Coleman. But again, I think at this point, just, just throw the ball down the field. Take a couple of Hail Mary shots. Why not? Well, you got to be careful, too, because you're going to have a, a first-time starter in the pocket with the ball waiting for those guys to get downfield, and he's already fumbled the ball twice in this game. It has been pouring all night. This game started with a 45-minute lightning delay. Temperature in the high 30s, wind chill, low to mid-20s here in Fort Worth. Play clock down to one, and they're taking a knee. <laughs> And Gary Patterson not going to call his final timeout. They will reconvene on their respective sidelines and game plan for overtime. Now it's going to get exciting. <laughs> One can only hope. Tied at 14, the end of regulation. Neither Baylor nor TCU scored in the second half. Three of the four touchdowns came in the first seven and a half minutes of the opening quarter. Baylor made it look easy on the first two drives. A pair of rushing touchdowns by Devin Chafin. Trevon Boykin had a touchdown pass for TCU. And then this play, Johnson gets stripped. It's picked up by Josh Carraway. He returns it for a touchdown that tied the game in the second quarter at 14. And we'll, we're still there as we head to overtime. It's been windy, cold, rainy throughout. We had lightning before kickoff. Neither team has tried a field goal. So the question is now in overtime, who has the advantage? And you would think 
that Baylor, with a big physical quarterback, 240 pounds, to be able to run the football in the red zone would give the advantage to Baylor because Boykin really has been limited with that ankle and is not going to be able to affect the defense running the ball like, like he normally does. We mentioned that Oberchrome is a better kicker on longer attempts for TCU, but you know, Chris Callahan, on short kicks, he's been good. And he's made 105 consecutive extra points. It may come down to that, an extra yeah. point or a short field goal. We're going to take the coin toss live here to see who will start with the football first. TCU playing with an injured quarterback in Trevon Boykin. Baylor with its third string quarterback in Chris Johnson. Mike Defee has had some trouble with his uh, microphone because uh, of the uh, the rain. He's explaining the overtime rules right now. Each team will get a possession. And we'll go ahead and break down the, the overtime rules for you here. TCU won the toss. TCU is going to take the ball. First. So we're going to play to our right. That's what I could gather from that. The TCU won the toss and elected to take the ball first. Uh, so each team gets one possession from the opponent's 25 yard line. There's no game clock or play clock. And once you get to the third overtime, and we might. You got to go for two if you score a touchdown. I, you know, I was thinking about that. I don't know. I don't know that this overtime is going to take that long because these offenses have struggled so much in this game to to get anything going that this might come down to two field goal attempts. We're told TCU elected to play defense. That's what they wanted to do. They won the toss, wanted to play defense first. So yeah, you know what you have to do when you get your shot in this first overtime depending on what Baylor does offensively. Chris Johnson, the third string quarterback, making his first start, trying to keep Baylor's hopes alive of a Big 12 title and perhaps a spot on the college football playoff. They come in number seven in the latest college football playoff rankings. The Bears need to win tonight, beat Texas next week, and have Oklahoma lose tomorrow at Oklahoma State. Chris Johnson has not completed a pass in the second half. Well, it's going to be Devin Chafin. And not shock Linwood in there. Chafin's been the workhorse in this game. 22 carries. And Chafin goes down at the 21. Picks up four yards. Kindred on the stop. Chafin slow to get up. Don't know if uh, it's because Chafin has been getting the bulk of the work. They want to keep him going. Or if it's because shock Linwood is not 100%. He took a tough hit there. They got to get him out of the game. Took a hit on his head and came up a little bit. Uzi. I got to imagine Libwood's not 100% or he'd be in yeah. right now. Jefferson in for second down and six. They'll keep it on the ground as the quarterback Johnson picks up the first down to the 14 yard line. The 235 pound sophomore moves this change that time. And I, I think that's an advantage for, for Baylor and you can't worry about him getting hurt now. No shock Linwood and now Chafin on the sideline. Jefferson is more of a speed back, which doesn't help you much in the red zone. From the 15 yard line, here's Chafin down, or Jefferson rather, down to the 10 yard line. Ty Summers made the stop. Second down coming up. Here in the first overtime in Fort Worth. Second and six. Got a big number 80. Laquan McGowan in at tight end. Fuhrbacher's in the backfield to help block. Jefferson inside the 10. Stood up around the 9. Denzel Johnson was there for TCU. It's going to be third down and about four. Oh, enough. I'm Chris Johnson. I'm reminding Johnny Jefferson right next to me to protect the football. Get what you can on the ground, but protect the football. Talking about substitution on the sideline, and the play clock is winding down under 13 seconds, and they still don't have a play call. Each team with a timeout here in overtime. Play clock down to five, third down and four. 
Will they keep it on the ground? Yes, they will. Jefferson inside the five and down at the one yard line. It'll be first and goal from there for Baylor. They say he went down at the two. They spot it there. Jefferson slips. Mark him down at the three yard line, so he lost a yard of the play. Second and goal for the Bears. Boy, he, even if he didn't slip, he wasn't going to get much further because Caraway, two other TCU Horn Frogs coming free in the middle. And good news for Art Bryles and Baylor that Devin Chafin back into the game. You need to give Jefferson a blow. If you're TCU, do you just sell out expecting run here? Absolutely. Make them throw the ball to beat you. And you sell out, and you see there's no, there's a O'Mealy and Julius Lewis are outside. Everybody else is in the box. Johnson keeping, and he's not going to get it. Dragged down for a loss of one. Terrell Lathan made the tackle at the four. It'll be third and goal from there. Now what do you do if you're Baylor? <laughs> Same thing. I'm selling out. No, what if you're Baylor? Are you are you going to throw the ball here into the end zone? Oh, uh, well. I'm going to continue to run the ball, Dave. I'm going to really? continue to run the ball. I'm just not going to run it in the, in the middle. Get on the edge. The zone read with Johnson has been the best play in overtime for them. See if they take a shot to throw the ball. They will. And here's the jump pass. It's caught. It's a touchdown. Devin Chafin pulls it in. They ran that earlier in the field of play, and it worked. And it works here on third and goal to get Baylor the lead. They put pressure on Traven Howard, the Mike linebacker, making it look like Johnson's going to come right downhill, right at him, and they just slip Chafin right behind him for the touchdown. It's his third score of the game. Two on the ground. That one receiving. And now Callahan has made 105 consecutive point after attempts, trying to give Baylor a seven-point lead. TCU will get a shot. That was a high snap. The extra point is good, though. Seven point lead for Baylor. So let's let's put you in Traven Howard's shoes here. Here he is right here. And the quarterback's gonna act like he's coming right downhill. And then he just jumps up. It's that Tebow pass. And Chafin goes right behind him. And give credit to Chris Johnson. Been a struggle. Six completions all game. None bigger than that one. And again, remember, with, with the injuries, if, if Baylor were to win out and Oklahoma were to lose and they're back in the college football playoff discussion, this is what happened with Ohio State last year when they got to their third quarterback because of injuries. It'll certainly be a topic of discussion in that room for the college football playoff selection committee. Well, we still got yeah, some two. work to do here with TCU getting possession at the 25. Number two still has something to say about that. That's Trevon Boykin. It's been a struggle for him as well since that touchdown pass in the opening quarter. And Boykin get a keep. He has no running room. Taken down for a loss. Grant Campbell in the backfield. A four-yard setback. What does Phil Bennett do? We talked a lot about Patterson. Phil Bennett a year ago in this game. It was a much different game, 61 to 58. But with the game on the line in the fourth quarter, Phil Bennett came after. Trevon Boykin repeatedly will he do it here in the red zone in overtime and he's without his top target Josh Dotson out with a wrist injury done for the year Boykin to throw and he's going to throw short Merka knocked out of bounds at the 21 so they get seven yards there. It's a third down and a six. Good decision right there by Trevon Boykin. Get back into a manageable situation. You know that you have four downs. So you don't have to get it all on second down, force the ball down the field, dump it down, and put yourself in a good situation. Still have this opportunity, this matchup. Brian Reed, the corner on Porter, giving up four or five inches. Or do you try to pick up three or four and put you in fourth down and short running the ball? Boykin's going to throw, moving around. Boykin looking into double coverage. 
And there was contact and a flag. They run into Lissenby. Chance Waz and Xavier Howard. And it's as if Howard said to Waz, what are you doing? Don't make contact on Lissenby. And I think Phil Bennett saying the same thing. Yeah, that was just a, a hope throw from Trevon Boykin hoping to get a pass interference call. Again, the, the microphone not working for Mike Defee. Sees great coverage. Xavier Howard's in good position, and Chance Waz just that's a young player, and he's you know making his ninth start. So first and goal on the Baylor six. They need a touchdown and an extra point. Although who knows, it might go for two. Gary Patterson did it last week at the end of the Oklahoma game, and it failed. First things first, they got to get in the end zone. Here's a pitch to Turpin trying to get in. He hit the pylon. They haven't signaled yet. No, they're saying he did not get in. He hit the pylon. They're saying he stepped out of bounds first. Inside the one yard line at second down. They're celebrating here in Fort Worth like it's a touchdown, but the ruling of the field was he did not get in. Oh, that, that's a touchdown. Yeah. He's in. They they ruled that he did not get in, but they're going to review this, and this is going to get overturned. Yep. The head linesman, linesman right there, the L on his back. Good position to see that. Pretty clear. Gets the left foot in, and then kicks the pylon. I like that call there, too. You know, get on the perimeter, one of your speediest players. They've had trouble running the ball in the middle with big Andrew Billings in there. Good call by Doug Meacham. Both of these coordinators, Kendall Bryles and Meacham, done a nice done a nice job of continuing to go to their playbook and, and get plays in this overtime that can get the ball in the end zone. They so saw him step in the end zone first. They're looking at the feet, looking at the ball there on the uh, replay. Assuming this gets overturned, that it's a touchdown. We mentioned Gary Patterson went for two last week at Oklahoma. It didn't work. They lost the game. Do you do it here? Do you I take a chance? I didn't have any problem with his end of game two point uh, try. The third quarter one was the one that that was the mistake. Too early in the game to attempt that. I think Gary Patterson would tell you that. I have no problem with him going to win the game. Now that was last week. Uh, this is a this is a different deal here. These these two teams are more evenly matched. I, I think I'd kick the extra point. I thought they should have kicked it last week. I, I think you should kick it here too. Again, we we can't hear, but they're they're saying that he was actually short of the goal line, but we can't hear why. We, we're not getting. The explanation, but they're saying that he was short of the goal line. Tom, you were down there. What did you hear, Luke's, from referee Mike Defee? Yeah, standing right in front of the referee, his microphone's obviously not working. What he is stating is that the runner's foot did hit the pylon, but that the ball was out Outside. of bounds at the same time that the runner's foot hit the pylon, puts the ball at the one foot yard line. So the ball that the ball never crossed the goal line. But it looked like I thought his foot touched the end zone first and then hit the pylon but that's not what they saw on replay second down and goal and Boykin keeps he's in touchdown TCU and they are not going to go for two over Chrome comes right onto the field to send it to a second overtime. Now you got Zach Allen out there for his first catch of the football. He's a backup quarterback. He's got to get this hold. First get the snap and then get it down. Made two extra points in the first quarter. This descended to a second overtime. It's good. Tied at 21 apiece. Back in a moment to Fort Worth. There you go. Trevon Boykin with a rushing touchdown to send it to a second overtime here in Fort Worth. Baylor needs to win tonight, beat Texas next week. Hope Oklahoma loses tomorrow at Oklahoma State. 
to have a chance to win the Big 12 and perhaps a spot on the college football playoff. Meanwhile, TCU trying to get its 10th win and play the role of spoiler against a team it has grown to hate. These two schools go way back to the year 1899. At one point, both these schools were located in Waco. Both programs took a long time to have any kind of success. Back in the mid-90s, Baylor was chosen over TCU to go to the Big 12. TCU was unhappy about that, but the Horned Frogs built their program, Conference USA, the WAC, Mountain West. Meanwhile, Art Bryles, when he got to Baylor, the Bears are one of the worst programs in college football, being in the Big 12, but he has turned this program around. They have won 11 games each of the last two years. And it's games like this that further the rivalry. You know, it, it doesn't become a rivalry until you have some of those close games and that bad blood. And last year certainly went a long way. And then you have to wait 12 months from Gary Patterson to get this kind of a revenge. And for it to come down to overtime is just going to continue to add to that rivalry. TCU will start with the ball first on the Baylor 25 here in the second overtime. And here comes a reverse, and Turpin was looking to throw. Now he takes off inside the 20 and steps out of bounds, short of the first down. How about that? A trick play. Turpin was looking to throw the football. The receiver was covered, and he picks up seven yards. I like it. I, I like the, any kind of misdirection because you force the defense to have to change direction. That's when you get those slips and when you get those opportunities to get the ball down the field. Second and three on the 18 yard line. And a big hole off the right side for Hicks to the 10 yard line and out of bounds. Everything outside. Everything is outside from TCU since the beginning of the fourth quarter. And Doug Meacham, Sonny Cumby making those adjustments, realizing that they're struggling to block this interior defensive line. So get it to the outside. First and goal. It's Hicks again, and he is knocked down in the backfield by Teon Sells. The loss of a couple, Sells filling in for the injured Orion Stewart, a first-team All-Big 12 safety who's out with a hamstring. Sells is a junior from Irving, Texas. He made the play, second and goal from the 12. Trevon Boykin, Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year last year, a candidate to win the award again. And I hand it off to Green, ran into a teammate, and Green is wrapped up inside the 10 by Oakman, so it's third and goal from there. Boy, and another adjustment from Doug Meacham has been having both Hicks and Green on the field at the same time. Now they're going to go into an empty set where got to throw and catch the football in this situation. Porter is man to man, the bottom of the screen, number one on Reed. Baylor rushes three. Boykin looking. End zone wide open. Touchdown, Turpin. Baylor will still get an opportunity. TCU going for the kick here to make it a seven point lead. Oberkron, the kicker, puts it through. It's 28 21. TCU. Devontae Turpin lined up in the slot. And when you rush three and give this much time, you're going to see Turpin is going to come up here, and then he works the back end line. But look at the time that Trevon Boykin has back here. There's too much time. Turpin was initially doubled and then just makes the inside move, and that's an easy touchdown for TCU. They were expecting the out route, and they got the in route. Trevon Boykin has made so many plays at quarterback the last two years, helping TCU to a 12-win season last year. Nine and two coming in, playing with a bad ankle. Did he just win the game for TCU? 
Or will Chris Johnson in his first collegiate start send it to a third overtime? What's your strategy if you're Baylor in terms of play calling? Well, the first overtime, it was run with Chris Johnson. And I'd be the same way. Here's Chafin, and he gets leveled after a gain of two. Boy, Ty Summers and Denzel Johnson have been everywhere defensively for the Horned Frogs here tonight. Second and long. Now, you know you have four downs. That's the mindset that you have if you're Chris Johnson that this is it. You got four downs, so you don't need to force the ball down the field. Chafin again, no running room. Gain of two. So it's third down and six. Baylor's Big 12 title hopes. Any shot of making the college football playoff on the line. These next two downs. Chris Johnson moved from receiver to quarterback. Just a month ago because of an injury to starter Seth Russell then Jarrett Stidham the backup goes down last week so it's on the shoulders of Johnson will they let him throw it here in third and six. He's going to keep it and he is close to the first down. They're going to spot him just short it'll be fourth and one at the 16 of TCU. And here Anticipate here that quarterback sneak you put in the Quan McGowan right there. <laughs> there he is at 410 pounds. He'll be running right behind that guy. And Johnson pushes forward. It's going to be close. Well, that linesman's coming in and he's short of the first down. Did Baylor call a timeout first? And the referee's mic is now working. We're going to see if we can read lips here. I think Baylor called a timeout. Yeah, prior to the snap. It was TCU that called. Oh, no, no, Baylor. Okay, he turned around. <laughs> Baylor called the timeout there before the snap because I don't think he got it. Art Bryles called timeout there before the snap. Would it have been a first down? <laughs> I don't know. That would have been 50 50 whether he got that first down. It didn't look like he got to that line of scrimmage. It would all have been about the ruling of the field. There's no way yeah, the replay yeah. was going to overturn. He had to get to the 15, and it didn't look like he got to the 15. So, Art Bryles is yeah. a good time out there. I, I don't think he would have gotten it either. That's so, fourth down, do you do the same thing? Wow. <laughs> That's tough. You know, it's been it, the, the most success and it hasn't been a whole lot of success on either side offensively, but the, the most success that Baylor has had has been in that zone read with Johnson and Chafin. And I think I might give Chafin an opportunity rather than trying that quarterback sneak again because it, they've had trouble moving Davion Pearson, Bradley out of that middle. Fourth down on a yard. They put Johnson in shotgun. And a timeout called by TCU. They wanted to see how Baylor lined up. Let's go to Tom down on the field. Now what Gary Patterson was trying to do, we're seeing a lot of stats do this now, is get a bunch of guys on the field at one time so they can always have the right personnel on the field based on the offensive package. And then he waits to see what Baylor's going to do. But at the last second, they got confused on who's coming on and who's coming off. And Gary Patterson had to sprint down to call that timeout. Well, they would have had well over 11 guys on the field. I think Gary Patterson was probably anticipating another quarterback sneak, and he saw Johnson come out in the shotgun with Chafin next to him and wanted to get a different play call. Well, this one has been epic for very different reasons from last year's 61-58 shootout in Waco. This game has been played in a downpour throughout Neither team scored an offensive touchdown from the middle of the first quarter until the first overtime. And now Baylor needing a touchdown to send it to a third overtime, faced with a fourth down and one at the 16 yard line. Now they're going to come back in a set that looks like they might go for quarterback sneak. 
Johnson, the quarterback, is 235 pounds. He's going to hand it off to Chafin. He's taken down for a loss. TCU wins. Baylor's hopes of a Big 12 title and a shot in the college football playoff gone. And it's fitting that it was number 42, Ty Summers, once again, coming from his middle linebacker spot. He's done it all night, and he got an assist from Julius Lewis, the corner off the edge. Mark Riles doesn't like the TCU fans on the field are talking some smack to him. He's not happy about that. Trying to find Gary Patterson for the handshake. They did look at it and confirm what we saw on the field. He was short. The game is over. TCU wins it in double overtime, 28-21. And everything TCU has been through this season, the two losses to Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, the Oklahoma decision to go for two at the end, 20 starters have been injured on this team, and they've missed 103 games to win this game. How sweet that is to get revenge for last year. TCU improves to 10 and 2, wrapping up its regular season. Baylor falls to 9 and 2. They play Texas next week, but the Bears are done in terms of the Big 12 championship picture and the playoff picture as well. I, I give Art Browse a lot of credit right now. He, he's looking for Gary Patterson. It's a melee down on the field. He could easily just go to the locker room, but he's a competitor through and through. He's a man of his word. He's sticking it out trying to find Gary Patterson. I don't think he ever found him, but at least, at least he's making the effort, Dave. Yep, I agree. Hard to find anybody in that pile that you recognize right now with the TCU fans storming the field. And those fans deserve a lot of credit for sticking it out. First of all, look at that play, Dave, where you, Ty Summers from his linebacker position, 42, he squeaks through there, and you're going to see that's Julius Lewis from his corner position unaccounted for into the backfield. But Summers, all game, made these plays. And you got to give him credit fighting through all the injuries defensively they lose both starting Mike linebackers and he played his tail off. What do you think of the call the deep handoff rather than the, the quarterback sneak. I'm fine with the call. I mean it's a short yarded situation. What else are you going to do. I mean they tried the quarterback sneak and that got stuffed. Yep. It wasn't the play call the reason why they didn't get that fourth down. It was the fact that TCU's defense was up to the task. Gary Patterson so proud of his defense they have lost just about all of their starters from last year's team due to graduation or injury. And our Bryles knows their shot of making the playoff and winning a Big 12 championship are over. 28 21 the final. Sports Center is coming up next. Stay tuned for more from Fort Worth. For Brian Greasy, Tom Lugan, Bill, I'm Dave Patch. So long for now. Steve Levy, John Boutrigras, Sports Center.